Hey guys, new podcast. Uh, real quick, let me run through some dates. Uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, January 28th through the 30th. Richmond, Virginia, February 4th through 6th. Pasadena, California at the Ice House, February 12th. February 18th through 20th, Omaha, Nebraska. February 21, Vancouver at the Rio Theater. I will be doing the Just for Laughs Northwest tour. Uh, March 17th, Columbus, Ohio. It is a call-in sick to work show. There is no typo on the website. The show starts at noon. I will be going to Dave and Jimmy. I will be drinking with Dave and Jimmy. I will be going directly to the club at noon, and we will sell it out. Do you know why? Because it's St. Paddy's Day, bitches, and we're getting fucking loose. My wife's not coming. Fuck her. Watch it. Okay, she's in the room. Uh, April 7th through 9th, Virginia Beach, Funny Bone. I will probably be canceling that. Because I've canceled on them seven times. <laughs> Why stop Rick, now? I am trying not to, but I just know that when I book that club, something really good happens in my career. <laughs> April 14th through 16th, Des Moines, Iowa. May 13th through 15th, Brea, California. May 9th through 24th. Is anyone going to even pay attention to this? I Washington, D.C. and then Burbank. And you're too I've, far out. I, now you're too, too far, far out. out. Fuck it. You okay. just need to do through the end of March. I don't know when they're going to listen to this. Through the end of March. Okay. There we go. Those are my dates. Go to my uh, BertBertBert.com. In the top right-hand corner, uh, below my name, you will see my Twitter link, my Facebook link, my YouTube link, and some link with a U. I don't know what the fuck that is. What is that? Oh, it's you live. Oh, is that still up and running? Yes. Oh, wow. If you want to see anything I've ever done on Travel Channel, click that. Holy crap. Oh, I learn something every day, don't you? Nice. All right. Nice way to go, Steve Axworthy. And those are my uh, those are my dates, and those are my info. And go to burtburtburt dot com and get yourself a shirt, or get my book, Life of the Party. And if you haven't, do me a second. Just take two seconds and rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast. Uh, this is a middle one, right? No. I- oh, oh, my wife's here. Yes, I am. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Bert. Uh, this today's episode is with the guy I talked about yesterday. How pivotal was this ep- this podcast? Uh, I think it was a pretty big deal, actually. It's a really big deal. I think this podcast, if you if you're a fan of comedy, which I don't know why you're lis- not listening to this, if you're not, um, this guy is a groundbreaking comedian, and we had a great fucking conversation that lasted over two hours, and then had another thirty minute conversation in my front yard about me and how I was working, and it was, I was uh, it was extremely eye opening, and I am very grateful. To have met this guy. I've been a fan of his for probably 17 years. He's been doing comedy 30 free, freaking years. Wow. Yeah. Is it before I say his name? Is there anything? 30 like, years? Yeah. 30 years. He's not that old, though. That's what I said. The whole time I kept looking at him going. Was he 15 when he started? I, I think he was 17 or 18. He's got to be like, I'm 45. He's got to be like my He said 30 age. years in the podcast. He said 30 years. That's crazy. I said I've been on stage 10,000 times, and I did the math, and I hadn't. <laughs> so I was like, I looked at it last night. I was like, I've been only on stage 2,000 times. But I've been on more than that, I'm sure. But I just, I'm trying to do the math of. Yes. Can you guess how high I've been in the air? Uh, 100,000 feet. Is that a. Loaded question? No. <laughs> so what did you want to... Do you want to talk about anything well, real quick you know, before the I podcast just, starts? I just wanted to say that this episode is brought to you by Squarespace. Start building your website today at... Spa- 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 space? Squarespace? S- yeah, that one. Squarespace.com. Enter the offer code BERTCAST at checkout and get 10% off. Squarespace. Build it beautiful. Build it beautiful. And this guy's built his career beautifully. Uh, he is, I'm going to say, I'm going to say the best storytelling comic out there. I, by the way, I consider myself fucking up there and I sat, I, I, let's be called spade a spade. I consider myself a really great storyteller. Uh, and, but and I'm not bragging. I'm just saying, I, I like go to bed and I go, you do a good job, Bert. This guy, I sat and watched an hour's worth of his videos of just the way he's told story. And I picked his brain and I am being dead honest with you. I, I've been working since he, we had this podcast on exactly what he said, and God damn it, if he didn't have the keys to the kingdom, mm. uh, you might know him from his uh, his TV show Titus. Guys, it is my honor in the man cave to have Chris Titus. Bam. This is my, my oldest, my youngest will not be going there. But my, 
I know you have what? What? My kid may go play professional soccer, but Notre Dame's gonna be. We're gonna work. We're gonna get him in there. Yeah. I'm gonna have to blow somebody. <laughs> There's like, no, yeah, yeah. there's no way I was making it in that school. <laughs> I love that kid to death, but man, school's kicking her ass. Um, I got him in mathnasium. I took him to mathnasium to get him some, uh, to get him like uh, some some tutoring. My dad never did that. My dad was like, "You do your, uh, hey, what is that your homework? Do it." Dad, yeah. I don't know how. To, shut up. Did they teach you in school? Do it. And I a DF. I was a DF student. I graduated. I had to go back to school after I graduated to finish summer school. They gave me. They let me participate in the ceremony. Yeah, but like I was gonna, t- they handed me a blank piece of paper. I didn't get my diploma. They handed me a blank piece of paper as I walked across stage because they thought, I guess, like how shady was I that they thought, you know, if we give him a diploma, he's just gonna run. <laughs> they gave gonna- you a blank piece of they paper. They did. So I had to go back. So there's no confusion, <laughs> right? Exactly. You didn't care. We're gonna let you do this, so you're not horribly t- traumatized for the rest of your life. But you, you better be back here on Thursday. That's hilarious. So you grew up in uh, in Southern California, right? Northern, well, back and forth. Northern California for a while, and then uh, I, t- from when I was a kid, I ran away when I was uh, when I was twelve. I got in a got in a, not a fight with my dad. Uh, it wasn't a fight. I got my ass kicked with my dad because my mom had brought me back uh, two days late from vacation, and my dad started calling her a cunt and flipping out. And so I, I remember I had, these, I had I had I had one of those you know those you used to you put a corner and you get that, you get that big plastic ball full of something toy yeah, yeah. and I had one in my pocket. And I was 12 years old, and, he was, and I just spent two weeks with my mom. And, you know, my mom was not, like, the most responsible person, but whatever. I was a kid with his mom. We had a great time with yeah. Idaho. And he, she brought me back two days late. And, and he was like, school's tomorrow, that fucking cut. And, she's, and he's doing this to me in front of my grandma, too. And I turned around, and I just winged this thing at him. This little plastic thing hit him in the arm. And my father was this big of a dude. He grabbed me by my ankles, both ankles in one hand, and just spanked the shit out of me. I mean, held me upside down. Fuck. I was 12, I know. And I was like, and so... And my mom, uh, about a, a couple years before, had given me 20 bucks in case I ever needed a call or for an emergency or something. Because parents, when you divorce, they do that weird, there's always subversive CIA undercover. I do that shit married. Don't you? Right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Mom's acting like a bitch today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just let me know. You get, I get, you get hand signs to your kids, <laughs> like a third base coach. Yeah. And they just turn around, we're going to go play. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. Um, so I, I, the next day was the first day of seventh grade. Eighth grade, first day of eighth grade, and I walked to the bus stop, and I got and I just waited there, and I stood there. It was weird. It was like it was, I stood there as everyone got on the bus, and then I turned and I walked away, and I walked down the street. I went to the uh, the freeway on Mowry Avenue in Fremont, California, Newark, actually the Newark side, and I, and I hitchhiked to the San Jose airport. I called my mom and said, "Hey, I'm at the airport. I'm not living with dad anymore." And I got on a plane. You're out twelve. It's twelve. Yeah, it's twelve. Holy so, shit! Man. Yeah, and the, and the dude that picked me was this, and I didn't know anything about gay people, but it was a Chevette. I'll never. I'm a car guy. Chevette, and he had a uh, flowered seat covers, flowered, and he was like, he's like, what are you doing on the freeway? And I was like, well, you know, and I and I'm, a, I'm a, it's funny because kids. No, now that I have an 11-year-old boy, I bust him all the time, so he stopped doing it. But we will, they will make up absurd lies. Uh-huh. So I start going, oh, you know, I'm, you know, vacation's over, so I was just going back to my mom's house. He goes, why isn't someone taking everybody? I go, oh, my dad has to work. So they just said, you know, hitchhike to the airport. <laughs> Shut <laughs> so, up. So this dude stays with me. He takes me to the San Jose airport, stays with me, goes inside and everything. He even bought me a book on Evil Knievel, man, and, 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 and he made sure I got on the plane. Holy crap! And then I moved to my to my. Then I called my dad from when I when I landed, and then uh, and I lived in I lived in L.A. for twelve till I was twelve till I was fourteen. And then at the end of those two years, uh, we'd been evicted twice with the sheriff. Like, it's pretty bad when the sheriff knows you by name. I opened the door. How's it going, Chris? Oh, hey, how's it going, Philip? You know, <laughs> I'll get mom. Don't worry. Here, just give this to her. <laughs> like, so that happened twice, and then uh, and then I came, then I went and visited my dad the next summer. Uh, two summers later, and and when I came back from summer, my mom picked me up at Burbank Airport, and we went to the bus stop. We got on a bus, and, and I'm like, "What happened to the car? Oh, I had to sell the car." Uh, okay, so we go to this bus stop. We go to Burbank, another bus stop in Burbank, and then we get to another bus stop. And I go, "Where are we going?" Because uh, the house is like not that far from here. And she goes, "Uh, well, uh, we got evicted again while you were gone, and we're living in a friend's garage." And I was 14, and I remember thinking. 
It, it, at 14, I was like, you know, I'm already having some major normal 14-year-old problems. Fuck. But you can't bring a girl home with a garage door opener. You can be <laughs> yeah, what do you think? <laughs> it's my mom's cot. Woo! <laughs> and so, so that was that was 14. And then the next day, I called my dad, and I, and I just – because, yeah, I'm a kid. I actually had no uh, loyalty. I'm not, I'm not stuff, stuffing this. I'm not stuff, suffering this for the garage. Fuck yeah. that. not doing <laughs> no it. Not fucking, no fucking way. <laughs> you know? <laughs> So uh, so that's it. And then I moved back to my dad's house, and then then, then after that it was uh, so I lived in Northern California from from then on, and I started comedy in San Francisco. You started in San Francisco. I started in San Francisco. Yeah, I started. No, when you started was your I have like a million questions, but I'm just, I don't and, but I don't have like I have no route of how I'm going to ask them. So hopefully I'll get them all in. Yeah, like, go ahead, man. Do you did you did you have your style when you started or did no. you? No. Oh no, I saw was shit on toast. Really? Oh yeah. Do well, you... I can do. I, I've told this bit before. One of the bits I had was I had a bit called car butt. When you're a kid, I tried to be Cosby. I was I wanted to be Cosby without the raping. <laughs> I wanted to be Cosby, and and because I grew up on Cosby, I decided at five I was going to be a comic. And I would do this thing: you remember when you're when your kid and driving around, you do that three hour trip and you get out and you got car butt, and I would do this stupid walk across the stage, and 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 then I did another bit about yeah, my shower has two settings, Arctic and lava, and I would you know, in the morning, and, yeah. And it was I did a five minute bit about waking up in the morning and how hard it was, and it was all innocuous nothing, and and I pulled it off with a lot of head movement. Like I like you know, yeah, yeah, a lot of head movement, <laughs> yeah. and I had this weird like it's kind of coming back now because we're filming this movie, so I'm letting my hair grow out. But we uh, like I had this weird this like my people would be like, dude, can we surf your head? Because it was literally this huge wave on top to the side, and when I moved it, it went da 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 da, and it was ridiculous looking. So I didn't even have a joke. I would just go da 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 da, and move my head like that, and then people go, ha, his yeah. hair's funny. I used to do this thing. I still do. I, I do it. I stopped doing it all together, and only because I was like, oh, it's a crutch. But then now I look at it and I go. I wish I could remember to do it more, but I used to be able to like open my eyes real wide, yeah, and it would get the biggest fucking laugh. Like just go like, like just make this dumb face, right? And my and I would get a huge laugh, and I I ended up all my fucking punchlines were like eyes wide open, and then looking like if I if you looked if I don't know why, but you uh, know what though? But now it's funny because now that we've done this for so long, and I think now we know what shit and what isn't. Yeah, I think now you can go back to the arsenal that because those arsenals saved our asses. Like we, can you imagine just being with not having those things and just t- telling shit joke after shit joke with getting no response? Thank God for my hair wave and your big eyes. Fuck yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Fuck yeah. <laughs> uh, now I'm trying to think of the bits I did. So, so when did you? What was the what was the progression from open mic to um to uh to the special that like literally I was I was listening to people talk about you uh, the other night. To they, Norman Rockwell, the, uh, the, uh, killing Norman Rockwell. Uh, no, uh, Norman Rockwell's bleeding. Nor- yeah. Norman Rockwell's bleeding. Yeah. Everyone was like, "Oh, it was like it was really cool to hear." They were like, "Oh, you have no idea that shit changed the game." Like he came out. I guess you did it in Montreal. I did it. I well, here's what, what happened with Norman Rockwell. Norman Rockwell. I, so I did that kind. I did comedy like the shit comedy for like twelve years, and I got to the place where I was because I had so much energy and I, I and and on stage, you know, I've always kind of thought of. Like Springsteen is the consummate performer. Springsteen never backs the fuck off. He never does. Three yeah. and a half hours. I saw him in '84, and I decided that I was going to perform full out. And Robin too. Robin. When Robin changed the game. When when Reality of Concept came out, I was like, because Robin just cracked open this toy box, and we were everybody was just talking, you know, from Mort Saul to to David Brenner. They were talking, and you know, and Carlin was just an amazing writer. And then Pryor was just telling stories. And then fucking Robin Williams came in and did ninety five characters in thirty minutes, and, and was like all over the place, sweating, yeah. no mic, just like yeah. Burr. And then the weird, like he'd go into his brain, and the, the comedy went it went stupid, talking about his dick and holding his dick to do, and that whole thing about the the inner voice in his head, about you know, and so. So what I did was I did that for a while. And I was headlining. I was been doing comedy twelve years. And I was headlining. And like doing the road, like uh, like Funny Bones or just yeah, like- Funny Bones. Yeah, but you know you're just barely making it. Yeah. You know, you're just barely- yeah. you're head- I'm a headliner. Yeah, yeah. And you're just the guy that goes up last right now. I told I made a comment one time to a club owner, and I was like, uh, you know, I looked at your calendar. I'm like the youngest headliner you got. And he was like, yeah. Cheap. Yeah, you're the ch- also like, also the cheapest. I was like, oh wait, I never thought of that. We're not <laughs> yeah. all making the exact same amount of money. <laughs> Everybody else isn't making eight fifty. Everybody else, really? There's someone getting more than me. You know Billy Gardell? Yeah, I love Billy. Billy Great said guy. to me one time, he goes, "Don't ever get ahead of yourself. You're always going to be a nine hundred dollar headliner deep down inside." <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> yep. I'm always that guy that agreed to the third show Saturday. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Deep down, if there's a – right now, my price is just higher. I'm yeah. just a more expensive whore. Yeah. That's all it is. If someone said, Titus, why don't you do a third show on Saturday in Houston this next week? Uh, I'd be like, uh, no. And they go, we're going to pay you five grand, ten, ten grand. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> all right. My buddy Tom Segura. Did you know Tom? Uh, I don't know him. I know of him. Very yeah, funny cat. He's very funny. He just he, his Netflix special came out and he was he's heading to Denver, and he called up and he's like, "Hey man, they want to add three fucking shows." And I was like, "Holy shit!" Yeah. He's like, "Yeah, it would be three shows Friday, three shows Saturday, two shows Sunday." And I was like, "What are they giving you?" He's like, "Ninety five percent of the door." I probably shouldn't say his numbers, but it doesn't matter. Because like, you don't know what night it could be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was, and I was like, "Holy shit!" And he was like, "I mean, I mean." Do I have the right to turn one of those down? I feel like it's a lot of work. I was like, <laughs> I was like yes. Yes, you have the fucking right. I was but like, that's the road in us. Yeah. They, they, I have to do that show too. Because, yeah, because like, there's never been – you get to that place where you're now all of a sudden making money and you're like, well, fuck, I got to do it. I got to yeah. – um, but so so we go back. So you, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think I don't think it's a bad thing. And now when I did have my TV show, I got – I was working so hard that I got to a place where I, I – I, I wouldn't stop working, but I, I got kind of snippy with everybody because I was writing, uh, writing on the show, acting on the show, helping direct on, on set all the time, and then and, and then and then Fox was sending me out to do fucking TCAs, and I was having to write new shit for politically incorrect or whatever. For, for, and so I was always I was constantly in the writers' room, and, and I, I got to the point where you you can't burn yourself out. We all are road dogs, and we can't burn ourselves out because if you do, you start to get fucking snappy. And that and I snapped on the network president, and and hence I have no show now. <laughs> Is that what happened to Titus? Yeah, yeah, really. It wasn't the ratings. Yeah, no. I, I, Gail Berman. We had three presidents. I told this on on, on Mark's podcast. We had three presidents in like th- three years, and I was at a deal at Fox during that time. Gail Berman. with Mindy and Michael. Oh, they're great. Yeah, yeah they're and great. I was. We were developing a sitcom, and every time I'd come in, and it would, it would. Everyone was talking about Titus, and it was like, it was like, uh, and and I remember there was just an influx. So it, was, it was Doug Herzog originally. Herzog and, was great. Herzog, yeah. Herzog's the best executive I know. Yeah. C- him and John Landgraf. But, but Herzog's this guy. That's really good. Keep doing that. And if something goes wrong, Herzog goes, hey, fucking fix that. Yeah. Hey, everyone, he doesn't have, <laughs> he doesn't want to give you a, t- th- a thousand ideas that don't, you know, if you're being funny, he goes, that's funny. We actually went into Doug. The, it's Fox promo department had, had came up with this shitty campaign, horribly shitty campaign for, for the show. And I flipped out, man. I'm like, look, we got this one shot, man. I, and I, I talked to Jack and Brian. I said, let's get the writers together. Let's write a bunch of – I go, if we, if, look, if we make the audience laugh in 15 seconds in a promo, I guarantee they'll watch the show. Fuck yeah. We debut with a 20 share. Because we those all the promos what were funny share. All the all the promos were just funny. It was Stacy Keach was pretty much in all of them and the kids and throwing me in the water and they, everything was just just set up, bam, me me talking to camera, set up and then hard joke. And that was it. And I think, The show is your fingerprint entirely. One of the few sitcoms yeah. that was just that was your fingerprint. Yeah, we well I wrote Norman Rockwell. If you look I mean the first episode we raped Norman Rockwell's bleeding. So what happened with when you asked how it got and by the way, keep me on track, dude. I will A D D the shit out of this. Um, um I uh I, I took this thing called the Landmark Forum, which used to be S years ago. A yeah. buddy I was having all these problems with my mom my, my, my mom was mentally ill, my dad was a raging alcoholic, you know, I was always I lived my life, fuck you, I'll show you. That's how I lived. Which is which can get you success. And also give you cancer. Like there's two things that get you. Yeah. And and so I was living really like, yeah, I'll fucking show these motherfuckers and uh, DF student bullshit, suck it. And so uh, a buddy of mine, um, and, and he's a great doctor in Chicago. He just he said, dude, you gotta fucking stop this. And I started using getting, he to take the form, and I was like, fuck you, I'm not taking it. You know, I don't I don't sell flowers in the airport. I'm not fucking drinking the Kool Aid. Fuck you. And so what happened was, is I I took it. About three years later, because I kept calling this guy and asked for advice. My dad and I are fighting again. Like, yeah. what do I do? He's like, well, take the forum. He, I, no, no, you just tell me what to do. I don't, yeah. you know. And I took it, and it changed my life. And I, I you gotta up. love that my fucking long guy. I like just it. I like totally it. I, I like the fact it. I'm doing a podcast. By the way, Titus is gonna be here. Yeah. Make sure you bring it. And no, get this supercharged. Not really fucking doing anything, leaf blower. To be honest with you. He's just gonna blow the plant off the table. I was on a podcast the other day, and he literally walked in and was like, "Hey, you got tree?" And I was like, "Okay, great." <laughs> Look, he's just blowing right at us. <laughs> it's all, this is great. <laughs> this so, is so basically you, every every movie, every comedy movie I enjoy. Yeah, he's just wow. blowing right in front of us. <laughs> <laughs> he's dead serious. Okay, so you, I want to see if he blows some shit off the table. Hey. What? I'm good. We're recording. All right. I'm good. And then he turned it back on. <laughs> yeah. I love that. <laughs> he's fucking... 
his my whatever my life is going on has no issue with him. He's like, that ah, I got I gotta blow this thing. Yeah, I got right. Hey, lawns to do. You do what you do, I do what I do. Leave yeah. me alone. <laughs> so you took so you took the took course, three day course, and then I took the called advanced course. And it's weird it kinda it kinda points out um like where you're like basically it calls you on your bullshit. It calls you on all the bullshit. And some of the bullshit that you have really helped you be successful. So, but you pick, it was your second choice. So, like, my second choice was I want to be successful, I want to be liked, I want to be the cool kid. I never was the cool kid ever, ever, ever. I fucking had to quit the football team. Uh, I actually, my dad made me quit the football team, so I was a pariah that year. I fell into a bonfire the year before that. It was just a fucking nightmare. Fuck. And uh, uh, so I was the loser in school. So what I did was, here's who, who I used to be. So I had the head cheerleader, cheerleader was in my um, home ec class. So I, I came back that year after falling in the bonfire drunk at a party. And everybody was like, I mean, I'm talking people wouldn't talk to me. I'm talking walking down the hallway, people just turn away from me. Because I was that fucking blow-it case kid. I was the DF student. If you're an A student and you do that, people go, oh, he's fucking parties like like a madman. Yeah. If you're a DF student and you, then you get drunk and fall into a bonfire, you're just the fuck up and people know you're going to end up selling meth at, at you know construction sites. God damn it. So I was okay. a total fucking loser. And, uh, and – so what I decided to, and here's my personality, and I still have to catch this because uh, it still comes up. Uh, what happened was is that she was sitting there, uh, Lynn was her name, and she was dating the captain of the football team. And I decided that's going to be my girlfriend. I'm going to show these fuckers. I didn't, I didn't, it wasn't because of her. I was like, she's the hottest chick I've been in love. I was like, yeah. oh, no. Oh, no. I'm going to show all these fuckers. that I, And I did. Three months later, she was my girlfriend. Just by being funny in home ec. Oh, shut up. Nope. And, was, and then and people with that then then it was a different kind of hatred. It was like, it was like, how the fuck did he end up with that? Because yeah. funny and you know, and I dated her to the end of school. Yeah, and then and then did, well, how old were you got into comedy? Uh, I, I I actually my first show ever was at the Senior Follies, uh, uh, at, at school. We actually did. Uh, I actually wrote. I begged them to let me do comedy because I wanted it since I was five. And yeah. then, and uh, they said okay, so I wrote. I wrote a bunch of jokes about all the teachers and the the yard guys. That he, this guy, Mr. His name was actually Mr. Commandatory, and he, he always Great wore a black name. long leather jacket. He it was literally he was literally he was one armband away from working for Hitler. He literally <laughs> and, and it was and, and, and so I did a big bit about him with his Doberman and stuff. And then we then I closed the set with I still remember it uh, uh, on how uh, step by step how to trash a freshman because we were the senior class leaving. I was telling all the juniors how to trash a freshman. And uh, we, it was really funny how to go through it, what, why they deserve trash. And then we brought a volunteer out. My buddy Tony had – we'd hogtied this kid, this volunteer kid, and dr- and we beat the shit out of him on stage. We had drug him. We dumped him in it. And it was funny. And then we left his ass in the trash can with his feet sticking out and walked off at the end. And it was great. It worked. Yeah. And it was the first time I was like – that first shot of heroin is a comic, man. You know. Yeah. Do you remember yours? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 100%. Yeah. I, I made a I, – I remember calling my dad. Right after that, I had to wait until I got home. Was just, there was no such thing as cell phones. Right. I mean, there were, but you could, I mean, no one had them. And I called my dad, and I had played baseball with a guy named Brad Radke who pitched for the Twins and was like was like a Hall of Famer in Minnesota right. where he played. And I'd grown up playing with him, and I called my dad that night, and I said, do you remember how when we were kids, everyone always knew Brad had something special, and that's why he was going to play pro? And he was like, yeah, I go, I found my thing. And he was like, Really? I said, it's comedy. I was like, it's, uh, I go, Dad, I'm really good at this. And by the way, I went up and did 20, first time I ever did stand up, I did 20 minutes on a showcase show in Florida at a bar. Wow. Where comics did 20 minutes in front of me. And I just went up and did 20 minutes free form. It was probably the purest. Just riffing. Just riffing. It was probably the purest to this day when I get to that place where I'm just free forming and not, and I'm not going to my set. And I'm just, it's, it's a flaw in my comedy too, is that I, I will look for that. I want the creativity, the moment, the inspiration more than I want to tell a story that I've told a million times and get and get thunderous applause. Right. I want I want that. I'm like I'm, you like to be out on the walk in the rope. I love it. And and I, that first time I did it was like that. And then the next time I was in in the, I moved to New York right after that. Moved right to New York and then started. like you like first set took off. First set and then I was like I'm moving to New York. Wow. I got offered a morning radio show by this. Uh, it's a place in Tallahassee where I was at. Right. They offered me my own show. They came and saw me. They put the whole show on. They saw me, and they said, we want you to give you your own show. And I was like, okay. And they're like, you'll be the third mic to this guy, and then when he leaves, you'll, it'll be your show. And I was like, fuck. So I went and talked to the guy that night at the bar at Pop Ellie's, and he was like, I go, why are you going to New York? And he was like, he was like, why, who wants to fucking stay in Tallahassee? Yeah. And I was like, well, not me anymore. In my head, I was like, 
If I just oh, by the way, I was also written up in Rolling Stone magazine as the number one party animal in the country. That's, that's right. That, that was that whole. It. And that was the whole uh, Van Wilder thing, yeah. right? And so that that's was, legendary. Uh, yeah, yeah, he's good. He got something. It, it's weird. Oh no, I, I did nothing so, to do with the movie. S- someone told me about you that that you have this way of like I have always felt like I had to, and, and I'm sure you feel this way, but but it doesn't seem to anyone else that you bang your head against a rock wall for five years and then something happens. It seems yes. to be like, uh, yeah, what happened? Well, he fell out of an airplane and he fucking landed uh, on a fucking pile of money that for some reason is his now. Yeah. And then, then then some supermodel decided to marry him. Yeah. Uh, and then some guy, then BMW wanted to sign him, so they gave him three cars that he wants. And fuck, really? Yeah. I fucking hate him. <laughs> yeah, I, I was, I was, I still to this day, like I... I, I appreciate those guys who go, it's all about hard work. Well, I think a lot of lo- it is luck. It's not just the hardest working guy. A lot of it is luck, and I am oh, very not, lucky. Yeah. I'm really lucky. But I've been, you know, like I was just had to fill out a form for Travel Channel. They're like, how many stand-up shows have you done in your life? I was like, because for these stats. Right. And I had to do the math. I was like, holy shit, I've done like 10,000. Well, I fucking have earned the right to yeah. say I'm a comedian. Yep. But then, oh, yeah. but, 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 but yeah. No, so wait, let's get back to you. No, no, I'm not saying it's... Uh, no, because here's the thing. Cause I, I know a lot of guys that are, quote, lucky that got yeah. big shows, and I go watch their sets, and they, they're they not fun. I go, yeah. holy shit, this guy's not funny. I, I get the rap because <laughs> I'm, I'm a big drinker, and it looks like I'm fucking around on stage. Yeah. But like even when I'm doing the stuff I'm working on, it looks like I'm fucking around. Right. So a lot of... So, I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah. But uh but I'm and I'm dying to ask you how you work on your stories cuz I'm I'm like but not yet, but not yet. Okay. I want to know so this program then took those, form, yeah. all those things that you that were helpful to you in childhood to get the hot chick. You then applied them yeah, so, to your work. Yeah, so what happened was so then with comedy, I started in San Francisco and uh and I worked I, I, I I'm this guy, I'm the opposite of you. I'm like I need to get a concept and write it, you know, Carlin's, about, I'm a huge fan, and I, have, I will, I, was I will. praying to God you were going to say something else, because like, because I, I have obsessively watched you online, like, all your oh, stories, really? your story, you're the best storyteller working, there's no question yeah, about it. But I got it. a formula for it, I can teach anybody how to do it, that's the thing, is that, I'm fucking, I'm obsessed with story right now, I'm obsessed with, um, oh, I'll tell you how to do it, it's easy. I'm obsessed with, with, pres- like, I literally sat the other day, and I was like, best stories I've ever seen in movies, best stories right. are like, uh, Fucking usual suspects. It's told backwards. Yeah. All of a sudden, Pulp it all fiction. unravels. Right. Pulp fiction. You look at five different stories all coming together as one, and then and then like uh, the sixth sense. He's yeah. dead at the fucking. I'm watching these stories, and I'm like, and I'm then I'm watching you tell stories, and and you have such an easy way about it that it looks effortless. And I'm like, I'm like, and I'm and I'm like, there's got to be there's I'm like pray to God there's a fucking formula to that. Yeah, but, but that you can apply, but like yeah, you can apply. I can teach him, but 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 the good news is now is that I used to be so obsessive because I was so frightened on stage. I, I I can't stand not getting laughter. I can't stand it. Like it's like every comic can't stand it. Yeah, it sends me into a depression. If I have a bad set, <laughs> yes. I had a, I had a bad set. I uh, I went down to the improv and it was Spade was there and Schwartz was there. And then Joy Coy was there, and, and I, I this whole new show I wrote is all about having kids. Well, Coy goes up in front of it and does literally like the the fucking bit about his son. It's the, literally it's my, his version of what I'm doing or my version of his whatever. And I was like, fuck. And I already planned it, and I and I and I and I switched it up to another bit from the show, but it was still about kids. And he killed, and I got I got to admit, man, I had a bad set, and it was the first time I had a bad set in like seven years. Yeah. The only other bad set I had was at a at a big corporate thing where the boss had, was drunk and had talked for forty five no for two hours and forty five minutes, and then he started the comedy show, and I was like, fucking, just give me the check, you know, those where you yeah. just burn through it. But I was at the improv and I tanked it, and I and I, and I went home and I was just I was literally in a, like a like a, and I've been doing this almost thirty years now. I was in a depression. Yeah. I didn't just blow it off. It took me two days to blow it off. So I still have. I still love doing it. And still doing it. So yeah. So what I did was I uh, with stories. Um, you want to hear about the thing? So so what I did with comedy is I I would start in San Francisco and I decided. A lot of the older comics, Slayton was there, and Slayton just fucking gave everybody shit all the time. But I took it real personal. There was a guy named Monty Hoffman. Did you know Monty Hoffman? Uh, I, I, do, I do know Monty Hoffman. He's not around anymore. I know. Right? Yeah, I know. I know who it is. Yeah. Uh, I is don't it, know. Just, oh, he was on uh, Last Comic Standing. 
Oh, were the ball game? I want to. Th- I want to say so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think he died. Yeah, I think he passed away. But yeah. he was. Uh... He was an asshole. He was one. Of, he was one of the worst people I'd ever met in my life. He really? would literally. Women would come out of the the ha ha go go. And by the way, people say, "Oh, don't make don't don't talk bad of the dead." Well, if the dead were fucking cocksuckers, okay. <laughs> so he would walk out of the ha ha go go. He would walk out of the the uh, ha ha go go uh, or the Holy City Zoo and just turn to any chick. And this and the weird thing was this where he'd go. He goes, "Hey, you want to blow me? Seriously." You see me on stage? You want to blow me? No, no. Tenth, eleventh chick? Okay. Fuck. How the fuck did he do? <laughs> yeah. I couldn't even attempt it. So, But he was just not... I mean, and he would fuck with all the comics. I saw him one night. We were doing the San Francisco comedy competition. And Johansson, who's really a great comic. Jake is so funny. And but he was at his peak. He was like at that young, like full out. He'd written the bit about Jesus and you know, what if Jesus had slept in a bathtub and they had a, instead of a cross on the wall, it was a yeah. tub. And it was just a, it's a brilliant piece. And Monty, uh, and Jake's killing it. He's in the top five, and Monty just kept fucking with him. just And meanly, not not being comic, but fucking with him, trying to fuck up his set. Yeah. And I remember hating the guy for that. Um, so I decided that I was going to become the best comic there was. I just decided. And so I, I hit the road. I had $700 phone bills when, when you have to have to pay for long distance. Oh, yeah. And I just fucking, and, and that's, what it, that's, what, that's what made me successful is that I had this road dog, fuck all these guys, I'll play anywhere, do anything, but I'm going to get good at this. And that's also, but I wasn't happy. I was like, I was like, I was just, a, you know, I would come back to San Francisco with all the new material and people were like, Where, you were gone for four weeks and I go, yeah, I was working the road. Um, and I always hated, I, I made a decision there too about comics, comics that bitch about audiences on the road. I decided that I would never, I would always try to keep it smart and keep it good, but if it didn't work, I had to figure out how to make it work. Some comics, San Francisco, San Francisco is just like living in a, You've worked there, right? I mean, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. so I'm wearing a cop comedy shirt. Right, <laughs> right. It, it's this weird cocoon, like womb, like uh, like Austin. It's like you know, it's like you can do anything in San Francisco, and people, you know, uh, uh, Bob Rubin, who's hilarious, used to fucking put a ham on stage, put a light on it, and he would sing an Elvis song off can- off off the stage. Yeah. And it was fucking hilarious. Yeah, in San Francisco. In San Francisco, right? And so, I, and those guys would come back and oh, the fucking road sucks. You people are stupid. And so I decided that I was never going to blame the audience. I made a decision there. Dana, I got to work with Dana Carvey often, and uh, at the beginning, he gave me a lot of advice that I still use to this day. Uh, and but I but I was just really just grinding it out. And then I moved. Then I got the Kenny Loggins tour, uh, and then I moved to, moved to L.A. way too early. I moved to L.A. in '88. And then just started working the road, and I jumped into an acting class, and I just nonstop. I just thought of something. I've been nonstop for thirty years, man. It's like, you know, there's yeah. No, there's no time off. No, uh, there's. You don't get. I, I don't get an opportunity. I was. I'm in therapy right now, and uh, I was telling my therapist. He's like, you need a hobby. I go. I'm doing a vlog on you know, on YouTube, and he goes, it's not a hobby. That's work. Yeah. I go. Well, I write jokes. It's it's kind of like I take. He goes, that's not. A hobby either that's work right and he's like you need like a hobby so i started doing leather working cool and, and it was just so that I, and but it, what it would do it would do is shut my brain off yeah and so i wouldn't think about work because i'm obsessive about it but i i agree with what you say about the road and it's something i didn't respect out of what for me was that was the alternative scene when i come to la and they were like oh the fuck who wants to do the road i went to dallas they're fucking horrible audiences and i was like i went to dallas and i had a hard time too but I just figured out how to make strangers laugh. Right. By the second show, you were like, I'm adjusting this, and I yeah. got it. Right. Clearly, they – like, like I remember I'm, – I'm trying to think of an example. But, like, I remember going on the road originally, and I'd started in New York, and I realized, uh, oh, they don't have taxis here. So all these taxi <laughs> bits I have don't fucking work. Right. And and they also don't have Puerto Ricans. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> I was like, I need to rearrange this set to what goes on in life. And I, that – but it's one thing that's always frustrated with me is people that go that look at the road or guys that do well on the road and they assume that guy must be a hack because he does well on the road. But the other side of it is some of those guys are fucking horrible hacks. Horrible hacks. But they'll destroy a room. You see them come to L.A. and do a set in L.A. and they're like, so uh, what's up with the, the Marlins? And yep. everyone's like, what the fuck? Yeah, I, I, gotta, live in I gotta be honest with this. I said at the improv, I thought that I thought I left after that bad set and I was like, fuck, man, did I, did I, did I, have I fucked up my life? I've said that to myself a million times. What times. happened? Did I get a virus on the road and I'm not funny anymore? Like it was really it, for a guy who's done as long as I have as many specials. I I, I I think we're still like you said we're still the fucking same guy that went up that first night scared out of his mind. I don't think you were scared out of your mind. I sensed that you were like I'm doing this. I'm just gonna do 20 minutes. Oh, I was terrified. I was oh, I went and got a beer. I've said this now a hundred times, but I went and grabbed a beer and the guy, a guy that uh, Christian Harloff who works at the store who hangs out at the store, uh, was happened to be doing a show with me on that night. He's still doing comedy. I'm still doing comedy, and he just happened to say. 
hey man, if I were you, I, I wouldn't do that. And I was like, what? He goes, that can turn into a really bad habit. She'll need it to get on stage. And I literally put the beer down and I said, all right, I'm going to do this sober. And I was, I was, I was like, I remember thinking, how do I start them laughing? If I can start them laughing, right. I can keep them laughing. Right. But I don't know how to start them laughing. And I mean, I think that was my problem for a very long time in comedy was like, how do I get the ball rolling? Right. And, uh, and, and it's, you know, it's, I, I look back and I go, I can't, I can't believe I'm the same person that did that. I have a hard time calling in sets in the city for the same reason you do. Cause I go, I'm home, man. I don't want to fucking deal with yeah. bombing at home. And cause if I bomb in Edmonton, I get another show that night to fucking rectify things. Right. Well, I bomb here at the store. I bombed at the store in between Bill Burr and Joe Rogan. And I was like, Burr goes up and he's just fucking lights room on fire. And I really get put in my place of where my act is. Right. Like, and I was like, Holy shit. And then I was like, well, you know what? In my head, I'm like, I'm like, you know, Burr just took the energy out of the room. Joe just goes on and fucking destroys even harder. And I went, no, no, no. It's not them. It's me. Yeah. And I was like, I need to be writing. I need to be working. I need to be doing stuff in the city and challenging myself and making myself uncomfortable. You know? Well, my wife said that to me. She's a comic, too. She said, you need to start doing this. And I'm like, I just did seven shows. You know, we're doing theaters. We started our own uh, a live performing company, a promotion company. We're promoting our own theaters now. And it's working. And and I'm like I don't when I'm home, you know I rent a I rent a, a soundstage that we're we're, we're starting we we're doing pre production on a movie right now that we're going to start in February and I'm like, you know I don't I don't I don't it's not even that I'm I'm afraid of it I just don't why do I look I write a ninety minute show it's got a beginning middle and end yes it starts it, out uh, it starts out, I was born with a defect because I was born a child and it ends with this story about my daughter getting the cops called on me and it goes through all why you shouldn't have a kid and it's got a theme and I go. Why would I take seven minutes out of that and put it up at the improv in front of a behind some guy who just fucking made fun of an Adele song and another guy who fucking talked about his left testicle and, and you know and but then again I, I've never also never I'm also don't feel like I'm one of the alternative guys either I can't really go to Largo or, or Luna Park I think it's good I think uh, you could and I I deal with the same fucking problem is that I go I'm I'm I, and I and it's just by design of how my money is earned I'm a long form storyteller. It, it is. It's. It's where I've. It's where I found. Uh, it's where I found most success in my in my career is with longer crazy stories. Now, also, and, people, here's what you get, and maybe you don't. You, you agree with this? People always ask why. Like the, the Springsteen story I told uh, is is 28 minutes. That, okay, that's. I, that is like I can't put that in perspective to someone <laughs> listening to this. That is like saying. Um, it's like uh, there's. It's like saying Lenny Kravitz went up and did the whole show uh, by uh, but by himself, but playing the drums with his feet. I mean, it's so fucking hard. You have no idea. <laughs> I tell a twelve minute story, and I and I said to someone the other day, f- someone said something, and I was like, "Fuck you! Tell a twelve minute story. You have no idea when that, when you start that story. There is a sense of depression of like I'm going to be here for a while. Yeah, yeah. And then if- you get to the middle of it, you're like, I'm still not even close. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, there's some good shit coming in three minutes. <laughs> Holy God! Yeah. Twenty two minutes. That is a twenty eight fu- minutes. Twenty eight minutes is a beast. A but here's day. but here's the thing is that like I never think of it like that because I never wrote. All right, so do you want to? Okay, so here's how I write stories. Because Burr, I asked Burr to come down and watch uh, to watch Voice in My Head before he filmed it I, at Flappers. I said it did in Burbank, and I go. So Bill comes. He goes, "Yeah, we'll check it out." He he actually he actually kind of hid because he thought he thought it, it sucked, man. I didn't, you know, I was saying nothing. I didn't yeah. maybe. And uh, I was like, "Fuck, I've been doing this a long time. You think it's gonna yeah. suck?" I just want to see what he thought. So um, I got my computer open in the back room. And all, and I write, I write it like a script. I write every joke. I write every joke because that's the only way I can get to get the, get. The, I can scrunch it down. I've you know listened to Seinfeld talk about writing. I've listened to Carlin talk about writing. I've listened and I, and I've taken their advice. And and so, so Bill just looks over. He gives him back to me. He goes, "You fucking write this shit down." I go, "Don't you?" He goes, "Fuck no, I don't say." I'm like, "Really? How do you know? Like, how do you know the jokes? How do you figure out how where your beginning, middle, and end is? Is it just, is it just over that time? You just, or are you just that so naturally funny? You just popping that shit off? Because I don't have that. I'm a fucking, I am a guy pounding fucking nails, man. When it comes to comedy, it's so know? interesting. Yeah, I don't write, I don't write long form. I don't write the story out. Yeah, but I, I like recently, I was like, I need to. Uh, I was watching you. Uh, you would take. I, I'm, this is literally the other night I'm watching you and I'm getting ready to go to Edmonton and I'm writing down what jokes I want to work on and I'm watched, I was watching you I was watching 
uh, the moth. I was watching st- all great storytellers, right. and I saw that you have jokes inside your story. Like you have fucking one liners inside your story. You have th- throwaways inside your story. You have all these jokes inside your story, and I was like, "Fuck, man, I need to, I need to really." And like, there's two stories that I've been working on that I cannot get. I can't break the code to. Okay, you ready? Yeah, I'll give you the code. What's you want the, the code? code? Okay, all right. So here's the thing. Here's how it works. Every single human being on the planet. If you've lived any time on the planet, you have anecdotes. We all have them. And when a bunch of fucking guys stand around and they talk to their friends, you know, that one guy says, hey, let me tell you a story. And the reason we tell anecdotes is because it goes on for four minutes and then there's a really funny thing that happened at the end. And then grandma said, said oh, I did took those pills. And you're like, because oh, grandma, you know, whatever. Yeah. Our job is to make that journey funny. So what I usually do is like I'll get a story. And I used to do this really hardcore. Now I'm getting better at it now. And what I started doing now is I found out that I can now on stage uh, kind of riff a story. Yeah, you know, uh, for a while, and then I'll then I'll, uh, first I do I, I riff the story, make sure it's funny, the, and then I go okay. Now I have to write this. But what I used to do is, and I still do it when I have something that's really big. I write down you got okay. You need to do the, the dragnet portion. You have to take your story and write down just the facts, just the facts. You don't want to write any jokes because we sit in a room by ourselves and we don't give ourselves permission to not be funny. We're comics. You ever sit down to write and you write for fifteen minutes? You go fuck. I'm fuck. I'm not funny today. Yeah. Well, no. Leno said once, he said that you, you got two halves of your brain. You got the left side and right side. And we live in a, a linear world. We live in, like, bills and fucking kids and what time is it, school shit. We live in that world of stress and getting it done. Yeah, And so it takes about 35 minutes to switch your brain to the creative side. It really takes it. And I guarantee you this. If you sit down and write for 35 minutes, just write shit. Just write shit. At 35 minutes, you'll write a joke that you go, that's fucking funny. And you'll be funny then. But it takes a while. And the more you do it, because I asked Leno one day, I said, how the fuck do you have so much material? Because before Leno got The Tonight Show and lost all his street cred, he was the best comic oh, you've, yeah. ever, you've ever seen. Oh, hold on for a second there, Titus. Uh, my wife just walked in the room. To, don't Please don't speak to her. But my wife wanted to say something real quick. I do. You know, have you checked out this Squarespace.com? Don't answer her. Don't Please don't answer her. Sites, they look professionally designed regardless of your skill level. There's no coding required. It's intuitive and it's really easy to use. And you get a free domain name if you sign up for a year. Pretty wow. fabulous. So you can start your free trial site today at squarespace.com. And when you decide to sign up, you make sure you use the offer code BIRDCAST to get 10% off your first purchase. Squarespace, build it beautiful. Build it beautiful. All right, babe. And Chris, please do me a favor. Don't bring up the fact that she just walked in the room. And we'll just continue with our conversation. You were saying? Just write shit. At 35 minutes, you'll write a joke. that You go, that's fucking funny. And you'll be funny then. But it takes a while. And the more you do it, because I asked Leno one day, I said, how the fuck do you have so much material? Because before Leno got The Tonight Show and lost all his street cred, he was the best comic oh, you've, yeah. ever, you've ever seen. I saw him as a child on Lena, on uh, Letterman or on uh, Carson, and his joke. I I, I, was, I remember sitting up in bed laughing. It was like uh, <laughs> he goes, uh, "My wife, I come home. My wife's like, uh, I can't find the cat. I can't find the cat." And he's like, "I'm oh, fucking two in the morning. The cat comes strolling in. She's like, oh, the cat.' And he's like, "Oh, what if that was me? <laughs> I come strolling in. You think I like it was like this yeah. great?" And I was, I remember laughing so hard. He walked on stage. I used to see him live. And when I started comedy, I was like, I was like 19, and I would go see him live. And and uh, I saw him. I got to usher one time at the uh, at Palace of Fine Arts for New Year's. They asked the, all the young comedy. They just basically they hoard out all the open micers to be ushers. You know, yeah. for, well, you can watch the show for free. Okay, so I get to work all night. And then, but but I wanted to do it, so I saw him and Kevin Pollock. And Leno would walk out on stage. He, his first joke would be, he just walked to the mic and he'd go, go uh, so, did you guys see uh, that Mother Teresa won that uh, Woman of the Year? Thank God. No, so, no, sorry. Nancy Reagan won Woman of the Year. Thank God she beat up that Mother Teresa, bitch. That was his first joke. <laughs> and then he would do it. He goes, he goes, it's great we have live aid and farm aid and, and we are the world. It's great that we raise lots of money. And, and people clap. And he goes, I got a question. Anybody here heard of voting? And it was like, <laughs> so it was like point. And, he, and it, was whole, it was like it did two hours and 15 minutes like that. And uh, he did my. First, I have a. I started a charity out of the forum too, and he did. He did the first benefit we did, and everybody. And he did the Tonight Show for years at this point, and everybody that came to that show walked up to me and goes, "I did not know he was that funny." I go, "What do you fucking think he won the Tonight Show in a lottery?" Yeah, he know? was a monster. He was a monster. He still still is a monster. He's but still a great. Yeah, he, oh, you see him? Go see Leno live. You'll be like, "Holy shit!" If you've yeah. never seen him except for the Tonight Show, go see him live. So what happened is, and a lot of comics rip on him really hard, selling his soul. Sell. He sold his soul. Sold his soul. I heard. The, I just recently heard the Bill Hicks bit about Leno, 
uh, and, and although the Doritos commercial was a bad move, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't, I don't think if anybody offered you or I three million dollars, we would go. Oh, fuck that! I'm holding on to my integrity. What was it Jim and Norton my '84 Accord? Uh, Jim Norton had a joke. Seinfeld's getting offered a million a year, and people are calling him a sellout. You, you could put me in a show called Jim Fucks His Mother Again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so just the facts. So just facts. Write the facts. And I, I always, what I used to do when I t- tell people to do this first time, just leave a space. Leave a space. Right. Every fact is dry as you can be. I mean, in, in every detail. You make sure you're detailed because that's where that's where um, someone said once, comedy is blowing. Stand up comedy is blowing the feather up in the air. The feather can't touch the, touch the ground. You know, it's the light. You just keep the feather up in there. Just got to keep it up in the air. So. So what I'll do is, so, so at the end of that you'll have thirty or forty facts. You'll have these, you know, uh, you know, I was at my dad's house for Thanksgiving. Um, uh, his his my stepmother uh, is someone I don't really like. It's just facts. But, but you're in your room by yourself. Why are you worried about being funny now? Yeah. Just you, you're you're doing your work. This is you're fucking laying the foundation. Then what you do is is you look at these things and you go, I got forty five things to write about. Shit, that's a lot of jokes I got to write. Fuck. So, so, and so that's that's oh, daunting. I never even looked at it that way. So, so then you, you just take your facts and then you go, all every, right. Uh, every the, fact is just a set. Ten. Every every fact is just a setup for a punchline. Every detail, every sentence is just a setup for a punchline. Every fucking sentence. So you have forty five things, right? And you just write. You just take the first one. Uh, I went to my dad's house uh, for Thanksgiving, and you, um, you know, because it, uh, because. Uh, Pearls working out for him. Whatever yeah. you write, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. and then that's that's the joke. And what happens is you have now at the end you have the forty five or fifty jokes, which is a monster bit. I was about as excited as the first Indians that went to Thanksgiving. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, great. I was yeah. about as excited as the first Indians. <laughs> that's that's I love that we do have an imaginary story that we are now <laughs> writing yeah. it for. But you see how easy it is. So every sentence, if you look at every sentence as just a setup for a punchline, the ones and, and, and the punchline doesn't have to. Follow the story because the 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 setup follows the story. You can literally the punchline can go fucking way off over here. You can go to Maria Bamford land with the punchline, yeah. And then the next sentence is back on the story. There's a there's a the the best structurally thing. Fuck, I, I've been what, like I I get lost in the minutia of the story. I get lost in like I I what happens to me is I feel like and I think because I don't sit down and write them out sometimes is I start veering off on. Like I take a fact that uh, that maybe isn't interesting, or 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 I, f- I get ho- I hold on to an emotion as opposed to a fact. Uh-huh. I, I end up writing right. stories with emotion. Like right. I was scared as fuck, right. and that, that's not really a fact. It's just I'm just saying I was scared and like, right. huh? Don't you guys get it? My eyes are wide. Come on. Yeah. Like <laughs> like, like uh, that's so funny. Like I have these. I've, the thing is, it's a lot of guys don't like to work like that. But but here's what it gives you the freedom to do. So let's say you do. Let's say you, you, you let's say you took this little formula and you wrote a, a punchline for every fact in that story. You, first of all, it locks you down to a story. If, especially if you have a, if it's a great story. So comics, we have these our anecdotes. It hit you to pass muster in a comics brain. The stories has to be pretty fucking good. Yeah. So our anecdotes are pretty kick ass usually, um, but. We we have the punchline, but our job is to make the journey funny. Because if you make that journey funny, that punchline that got that the end of the story that got a big laugh, just telling it dry, will get applause because you've actually now kept that feather up long enough and kept it going. I, I know it sounds like Professor Titus. No, no, no. I'm that's, just saying, but that's, that's perfect because I look at my story. The probably my, what's my, the one you're having problems with? What's oh, the one? I've I have uh, three that I'm working on. Uh, for, first one is. Uh, uh, the story about Ralph Sampson, the basketball player, right. he fucking hazed me if, when I was a child. Uh, really? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then I have one about scuba diving in uh, in Fiji. Right. I thought I was gonna. I almost died. Not almost died, but I thought we. I ran out of air at ninety feet. That's almost dying. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah no oxygen underwater. Yeah. Uh, that's close. And then uh, that's closer than I've been to dying. And then I drank uh, goat's blood with the Maasai chief in uh, Tanzania. I have these, but I have. Here's the other thing: it's like I have these little stories that are like nuggets of, or like the Ralph Sampson that I know. I've got a few beats in it that I know that are funny, and I can get away with telling them. Like the one about I have a story about flying dildos that I've never yet cracked a nut on, I, and I feel like the ending is too bad for it. But I look at like. And then I have all these, I you know, f- 
four years of adventures that I've done for Travel Channel. Well, that's the thing is that you've done stuff like that you – and not only that, but people that have come to see you are probably fans of the show too. Eh, I, don't, I don't think so. I mean, I think I think no? people that are fans of mine for stand-up are straight stand-up fans. They'll watch yeah, my show. Yeah, well, you're that good. Yeah, But they, want, they just want to – like I don't have much of a crossover. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah, I know. I, I will say this. All those people that uh, showed up uh, that are pornography, pornography for fans, I was like, they weren't. I go, well, you're, 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 one of these things just doesn't belong here. Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. I did that show. They paid me. To, they were like, I actually tried to you know, I tried to kill that show, by the way. Really? Yeah, well, they said they said uh, they want you for that show, Pornography with the Pawn Stars. And I go, uh, it's a game show. I said, I don't want to do a game show. And they said, well, they just said, what, what's your number? And I threw out a big number. I was like, okay, here's my number. I didn't know that Pawn Stars is like the no- top number five show. One. In like fifty eight countries, they got money up the ass. Oh, it is massive. Dude. They were like, "Okay, fuck," and I was like, "And then you can't be a dick and go well, I'll double that's, that." That's how I got into Travel Channel. Yeah. Uh, ultimately, it was I, I got offered that show, Birth to Conqueror, which I'm now doing again. And they, I said to them, I literally said to Dan Adler and Matt Sharp, "I, you guys can't afford me. I promise you, I my rate is this." And they're like, and they're like, "Well, Travel will never pay that." And I was like, "Okay." And then I remember the president of Travel Channel at the time. He's like, "Let us try. Let us try to give you a number that you'd be happy with." And I had said it to Dan and Matt. I hadn't said it to Travel, and I said it to my wife. I go, "If they offer me this, I'll do it." And it, they offered me that, and I was like, "Fuck!" I said, "I'd fuck." Yeah. And so and so I ended up doing it and <laughs> loving it and loving it. Uh, yeah, I loved it. It well, was the best. Well, Travel Channel to this day is the best experience I've ever had in television. I it. Oh, I, that's good to hear. It's I. I my goal is. My goal is ultimately to do what you did with Titus, to find a way to have your authentic voice on network television. I don't know if that's possible anymore. Yeah, I, I, TV's – that's why we're doing this movie. I, I, I've i sold five other things since Titus, and I just – I'm looking at TV right now. And the problem is for us it's really hard to get TV because you've got the biggest names in movies doing television. Yeah. So they're going – well, the, the, even, the, even, even the networks are like, well, let's go ask Travolta. You know, I mean, they're really asking. He's doing that movie on Netflix for uh, that that OJ movie. Yeah. You know, it's gets changed, and you know, you've got the best actors. Period. Doing TV now, and I'm like, well, I'm not playing that game. I'm funny, but I'm not playing that game. And so, I'm going to go the other way. I'm going to start doing movies now. I, I believe that. I believe. Um, I my theories on where this business are, is going are constantly changing. However, I believe that the Bill Burr Rogan Make your own content, yep. create your own content, put your own content online, drive them to your live shows. For me is where I'm at right now. Keep doing television, but like I'm trying to figure out in my head like uh, what I want to do scripted and why I can't do it by myself. And 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 then I, because I've been in development now, I think like I want to say like four years in a row. And they're so smart, aren't they? All the executives come in with such good ideas all the it's, time. You know, it, you know what it is. It's it's just like it's like if you give your fucking I'm not to make this sound about my wife, but if I to ask my wife, hey, what what is my how's my chili taste? She's gonna go, it needs something because she's not gonna say fucking nothing. I don't right. know, right? I don't I have no idea, Bert. You're the one that makes chili around here. I have salt, like right, right. fucking honey. Listen, what? you've made this. Is what I would love to hear. This is this is the chili analogy. You know what, fucker? You've been making chili for 20 years now. I I, I would never think. Of telling you, but here's some money to make some more good chili. Yeah, that's what you want them to say. Well, that's what Doug Herzog did with Titus. We came in with Titus, and and I fought him every turn. Uh, I also had two great guys. I had uh, Jack Kenny and Brian Hargrove, who kind of taught me how to write scripts. Um, they came in, and they were the only guys that I met with that had a fucking legal pad. They'd watch Norman Rockwell, and that's where everything blew up for me when I didn't. When I threw all my act out, I threw everything out, and I started over after 12 years. And I had some clubs that they were like, I went in with Norm Morocco when it was really angry when I first wrote it. And they were like, we don't want him back. They said really? he's too angry. Yeah. And then I had the same people uh, a year after Titus when I went back on the road. Uh, I, had, I had one of them, Sarah Nye, said, hey, I, she picked me up at the airport. She goes, I want to apologize because I wouldn't book you anymore. And I was wrong. I was like, that was fucking cool. Fuck. Yeah. Um, uh, what was I talking about? So it's, the network executives, they, they they let us just do it. They they were kind of like Doug was such a cool dude, and 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 Mindy, Mindy, by the way, Mindy Schulteis. At one point, we the script was so good, we had the script was so fucking funny, 
Um, because we basically just fucking raped the act, and yeah. then we had the black and white, and you know we that black and white and talking to camera, and then we had the everything was it was three different film styles. We we had to go black and white because I didn't want to have to tell the audience where we were. I wanted them to see it so they would just click. Yeah. So we did black and white steady cam, so it was always flowing, and then we did lockdown for all the flashbacks, and then we did four camera sitcom. So instantly, without thinking about it, you knew where you were. Yeah. There was never any confusion. But Mindy Schulteis, of all people. Uh, Sandy Grushaw was at, at the head of the network at the time, and uh, the, of the studio. And he goes, he's reading the script, and he's really uncomfortable. He had that network thing where people aren't going to get this. The first episode is called "Dad is Dead." We don't see we don't see Stacy Keach for the last ten seconds of the episode. Yeah, and uh, and uh, and Mindy Schulteis took that fucking script and slammed it on the table. This is the legendary story. And she goes, "If you don't fucking produce this script, you're a fucking idiot." <laughs> like like that, her job was on the line like it was like her fucking job was on the line yeah and she did it and you know I was hard on people too that show I, I was I, I was it was my name and I was I was at times I was it's gotta get done this fucking way we'd be in the writer's room and we'd come up with a great joke and, and i go okay guys that's great what's funnier and the writers got kind of I'm like hey hey I'm writing scripts too guys like what's funnier I go like, this is funny why? Why so we get five more minutes? Let's get something funnier. And everybody would fucking go, fucking bear down, and then push that one fucking that little, little bit of puss out where it was funny. We were like, yes, yeah, you know. And so we worked hard on that show. They were great writers, great people on that show, you know. And and I, it's my only regret in show business that meeting with the network president. It's my only regret where I just wish if I could go back to that day, get in the time machine, um, and actually two regrets, and, and they're both with the same person, Gail Berman. I, I should have just shut the fuck up. Don't let the comic go. Don't let a guy for 20 fucking years do what he wants, how he wants, all over the country with no – and then tell him what you want him to do. You hired me because I'm the guy that does does it well and knows what works. And now you're telling him what to do it. So as a comic, I would give advice. Don't go to the meetings anymore. Or if you go to the meetings, shut the fuck up. Yeah. <laughs> let every – get mad later. I've learned to get mad later. I, I had a meeting where the, the, right when they hired me at Travel Channel – they got fired the president that said, let us find the price. And so now I, and then they brought in a new president and she did not like me. She was like, stop production until he comes in and meets me. And and I remember being all fucking flamed up. Like the deal's done. Yeah. Yeah. And right. I was like, I was like, we're in the middle of production in the, mi- and we just it shut down and they're like, doesn't start up until you fly to DC to meet her. Ugh. And I, and I went in and my dad said something very smart to me. He said, uh, "He said, you know, you you can be, you can have hubris. You can go in and you can tell her what you think about this, or you can eat shit and cash checks." And he said, "You have a family, and this is bigger than you. You go in, you listen to her. Maybe she has something to say. She didn't get here for no reason at all. Maybe." And I went and I sat and I listened for one hour. She just berated me, like you have, like your digital footprints horrible you you have you're not a grown man you're still a frat boy like just really did not like me did not like me and uh Lorene Ong's her name I'll tell her name because we're friends now and she knows she didn't like me right. and uh, I didn't say anything and I said all right I said you know what I and I literally went in with an open mind and all the people Charlie Parsons was about to be about to get fired and or leave whatever he you know happened he, he was literally was like that matt butler talk, he took me down to like the other he's like that did not go well and i, but I, I didn't say anything i didn't say a word i just went okay she just yelled at you she, for an hour for an hour just <laughs> yelled at me about what and then but then started up production birth conquer was the second highest rated show on the network they had to do another season and ended up becoming my friend like literally like not a mentor i'd say in that we didn't but like someone i'd I considered a friend when she left Travel Channel. I was like, I was like, shit, man! I fucking made headway with that lady. Like, right. we've been together for four years. She likes me now. Yeah. But, uh, wow. But- I, where was your dad when I had that meeting? God, your dad should have <laughs> called. Fuck. You were on. You were already working on a show. Yeah. Fuck, I, man. I was. Uh- Titus, talk to my dad. <laughs> So, because uh, yeah. I would, I because eat shit and cash checks. I would, I'm done. I don't need, I don't need the whole talk. He could, you could have just said that walking by me. Titus, eat shit and cash checks. Okay, thank you, Bert. <laughs> Fuck. You know, uh, you know, Mindy's assistant at the time, Tall. Uh, yeah, M- Tall Rabinowitz ran NBC Comedy wow. for like the last four years. Wow, isn't that crazy? Wow. I walked into a meeting at NBC to pitch a sitcom, and I sit down, and it's, and I go, whoa. Tall. She was beautiful, still is beautiful. Yeah, but like I had such a crush on her when I worked when yeah. I worked with Mindy and Michael, and I walked in. And I went tall. She was like, "Yeah." I go, and in my head, I'm like, 
wait, wait, what is she? And I'm looking and I'm like, this is her office. I was like, holy shit, she's running NBC comedy right now. Wow. And then she was like, we'll do a deal. Like just, and I was like, holy, thank God I never hit on her. Thank God I just had a right. silent crush on her. Right. Um, but yeah, that, that, and th- they just cancel it and it's just. Um, the meeting was, you know, the meeting was, we had a meeting with, with Gail Berman and Gail Berman said, uh, Gail Berman, I, I find, uh, in all her shows, is an imitator, not an innovator, and she, um, and she's really, I mean, I mean, my experience with her, she was mean all the time, she was, if you didn't agree with her, if you had any, anything that didn't match what she said, you just kind of got cut off, I also did this in front of everybody, we were at the big meeting, top floor Fox, and I talked about it before, but, and I and Burr told me, quit fucking talking about it, Titus, Um, it's over, fucking 15 years ago, shut, shut up, but it's my only regret, and uh, I sent a meeting, and she goes, uh, Darman and Greg had just split up Darman and Greg and they and she one of them she had cheated with Kevin Sorbo and, and their ratings went up and so she said I want you guys for the next season she goes I want you guys to split uh, Aaron and Titus up and then uh, have them cheat on each other which we did in episode 4 episode 4 of the show and I said so she gives me this whole thing and that's what I want you to do and I and I, and I knew what Darman and Greg had done and I looked at her and I looked, I looked ha ah, I've told the story but I don't tell it anymore this is the last time I okay this is the last time I'm telling this story ever okay. in my life I will now just go yeah I had a show that's almost for now. But this is the last time. I look Gail Berman in the face and I go, uh, do you even watch the show? Let me explain to you how this show works. Now, uh, I'm at a table with the studio, all uh, my executive producers who should have punched me in the face, who should have just turned around and tagged me. But, you know, I had to prove my point because the ratings were great. We were getting, we were getting fucking like, great press and we were kicking ass. And, and I, It was critically acclaimed. And I said, do you even watch the show? I go, because let me explain how it works to you. I go, the whole show's based on two screwed up people together make, make an unbreakable bond. If I split them up, I've just lied to all these dysfunctional people around the country. These people that come every week to see that no matter how fucked up you are, you could still have a good life. I said, I said I've lied to them. The show's over. I go, we're done. We've basically set up a premise and killed it. It show's over. We're not doing it. That's what I said. I didn't say fuck. I didn't even swear during it because I was respectful on that. And, and she, man, it's the weirdest moment I've, I think I've had in show business. Gail Berman sat back, put her hands over, and she says, okay, do what you want. And that was all that was said. The next week, every promo spot that we were, we were scheduled for got canceled. Every single one. From now on, it said it would say it would say like seventy show Bernie Mac, and, and they would do commercials. And then at the bottom of the final ten seconds of the Bernie Mac thing, at the bottom it said Titus nine thirty. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. So I learned, and, and then and my only and my second regret is uh, same woman too. Um, they were talking about renewing the show, and the ratings were good. The ratings were doing well. We were doing well. We weren't sucking, and uh, we were holding our own. And uh, and I get a call from Dana Walden, and Dana Walden says, hey, you need to go have lunch with Gail Berman. I said, okay. And, and Dana Walden, who's really, like, amazing executive, she goes, she goes, and you be fucking nice. I'm on my phone, and she goes, <laughs> you fucking be nice to her. You take your shit, and you just sit there, and you nod. And I was like, yeah. oh, oh, okay. And that's not me. If you know me, that's not me. If yeah. I was there. So, but I'm like, all right, I'm going to do it. I'm, I'm going to lose the show. I thought that. And I went to this restaurant with Gail Berman, and Gail, it was a very cold meeting. And uh, Gail said, uh and I kind of, I kind of said, I said, you know, whatever you want us to have a baby, we'll have a baby. Whatever you want us to do, what, just tell me what you what you think you need to do. And I have to tell you, man, sometimes you eat shit and you don't get to cash a check. So you have to be careful not to sell your soul or lose your integrity. There's a point you have to go. Okay, you know what? I don't agree with you. There's a way to say it with respect. Yeah. But I sat in that meeting and I sucked it up and I kissed her ass and it didn't work. It was more like, a, okay, good. And then the show got canceled. They waited too. Show they had, were going to tell us they were going to tell us they had to tell us before midnight on this day to go to the New York, if the, and they waited to they called me I got a phone call at eleven fifty six, show's canceled, they woofkin waited. Holy shit! <laughs> yeah, so I learned a big lesson. Don't be don't be an asshole. But I also learned that's when I decided like I I produced my last two specials. We shot them. Really? Yeah, we shot them and sold them. When you say we, who's my um, my team? My hired cameras and we we did it and we did it for way less. Fucking way less than anybody's ever charged me for a special. I, you know, I, I was, I'm in the process of figuring out my next special. You, you talk, just call me while she had to tell you to do it, and you'll be shocked. You'll be shocked at how, how, how I, I got the first bid from a company, and I was like, I was like, hold on, and then I called up my production company. I said, how much do we shoot our show for? Because we shoot over four days, right? And I go, what cameras? Like, and I call my camera, my DP, I go, what would like a crew cost and what would like rentals cost? And he gives me the number. I go, where's this money going? 
Like I, I got really. I'm like, I'm like, just. And I said to one of my old line producers, "Can you just draw me up like a like a spec bid of what you right. charge?" And then she went, "This is what it would be." I mean, and I was like, "Motherfucker!" But then, in a weird way, I feel like it's that moment where if you don't play by the, I, I always feel like if you don't play by the rules and do it with one of the three companies that everyone green lights to do those, then no one lets you play. It's different for, for you, I think. No. How, how many specials have you had? Like six? Done six. I filmed the last two on our own. I executive produced all of them, but I, I'm really hands on, man. I don't like, I don't, look, I, I'd rather. The only special that didn't was it was called Fifth Annual End of the World Tour, and that was they took, Troy Miller took it over, and those guys, those guys at uh, Rick Mill. And I, what year is that? It was fucking 07, 06 or 07. I think we filmed it at the end of 06, aired in 07, 07, maybe 07. And it's the only one that they didn't take anything I said. They didn't give me any approval on sets. They didn't give me I, – I got to edit. I got to do one edit on it, and then they fucked that. They, they, they did what they wanted to. And it's the only special I, when I watch it, I, I just – it doesn't – it's not what I wanted. It's not what I wanted. It's not what I envisioned it for. I, I would rather – I'm going to go down – look, fa- I'm going to go down or I'm going to succeed, at, and at the end it will be because I put it out there. I'm a pain in – you know, I've been told I'm a pain in the ass to work with because I'm really specific. I'm directing this movie because I, I know what I want. Now, Titus, you know, and, and so you just have to – so here's what I'll tell you. So don't call a company. You, you know it's going to happen. You're funny as shit. Yeah. You're really funny. I'll oh, thank you. Okay. All it has to look like is a comedy special. Get four cameras, film it, <laughs> All it has to look like. edit, yeah. edit it, and 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 fucking you'll sell it, you yeah. know. But you know, I, I believe the universe rewards that kind of balls. The re- universe rewards it. You know, you you can't be arrogant about it. You have to be like, okay, we this is we're all in on this. You know, I'm I'm in in this movie special unit we're shooting. I'm I'm a third. Of, I paid for a third of the budget. I got two other investors, but I'm 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 putting my own money into it because yeah. that's because. You know, I mean, put your ass on the line, or you, this, this, it's too easy now. So I, so here's what happened. So I, I get a call. We're doing Neverlution. Uh, that was the fourth special I did, and I, they told me a uh, new wave call, and they said it's gonna, we, you know, we'll shoot it for two hundred ten thousand dollars. And I was like, and I, and I kept thinking, well, the way cameras are right now, that seems like a lot of money. See, doesn't it to set in one room for like a couple hours? Does that seem like a lot of money to you? And I said, by the way, fucking three of the cameras aren't moving. Aren't moving <laughs> at all. Someone just has to press a fucking button. Right, the two in the back is a wide and a tight, it's and it right. So, so fucking, you were holding the microphone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. I was just like. I fucking trust me. I had a right. Michael Bay is not going to blow some shit up during the show, right? Yeah. Are we gonna? Like, is there a car stunt in my stand-up special? How much is my wardrobe? Yeah, exactly. What am I? I'm. I'm wow. Um. So is the curtain made of money? Because are yeah. we just going to hang up? Uh. So what happens is I I I I just sometimes I'll get something in my gut. I'm like ah, you know, I want to see what this is. So I start calling rental houses, and I called a rental house. I called a bunch of them. And I called this one rental house, and I said, I need four HD cameras. I need a crew. I need a uh, truck that we can do, to do the switch, to switch it live. I want to switch. I want to do a, I want to do a line cut, switch it. And then um, I'm going to need uh, a, a guy that can do lights. And they, they come back, and they go, well, how long you need it for? And I go, I go, probably, I don't know, 10 hours, 12 hours. And they go, all right, it's, a, it's a 11 grand. And I went, no, okay, so how much is the truck? And they go, all of it. Ten-man crew, four cameras. Uh, and the truck, eleven grand. And at that point, I went, "Well, I know that I'm going to be there." Yeah. So basically, all I got to make sure is the audience gets there. Um, and so then I called the lighting guy, and I talked to uh, a buddy of mine's a DP, and I, I said, "Okay." And I think we ended up. I mean, it's crazy. It's going to piss everybody off when I say what I'm about to say, but comics should listen to this. My first special cost me twenty seven thousand dollars to produce, and we sold it to Comedy Central. That's, I mean, that's that, it, it, that's the same model that Louis said. I want it done this way. Yeah, Louis was kind of inspiration when when Louis did it and he did that online thing. I was like, well, f- you know, I mean, not 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 like I can do it too, but it was inspiring. You're like, fuck, you know what? Yeah. And now he doesn't have to do anything, you know, that doesn't want to do. And so now we're shooting this first movie, second special, and oh, and on, on top of that, we actually booked a theater and promoted it for three or four months. And we sold all the tickets. We didn't give any tickets away. So I made money the night we shot it. So I actually made money on the audience the night we shot it. I fucking... I'm not... 
I'm biting my tongue on a, on a lot of my ideas about this because I'm in that situation right now, and I we had a I'm up oh, I don't care. So we I had a, I had a <laughs> that was amazing yeah. what you just did. <laughs> I don't give a fuck. You just had three stories going on at yeah. once. You actually had a meeting in your own head. That was great. Yeah. I had an <laughs> offer to do it. I didn't. I said I want to do this at the DC Improv. I want to do my special at the DC Improv because okay. I love that club. I love that it's fucking broken. I love that it's got a pole in the center. That's a bad angle to see it. I almost wanted someone to shoot the pole in the fucking way, right. just the way an audience member would see it. Right. I love the low lights. I love everything about it. I wanted to keep the DC improv in the back. I didn't want to fucking right. That's what it's like to see me live. So I you know, we get like our first offer and I just and I go and they're like, "Yeah, but they don't want to shoot it at the DC improv. They want it to be in a theater." And I was like, "Yeah, but I don't do theaters." Like, I'm not a theater act. Like, I don't, I've never done theaters. I've done them, but like, it's not like, it's actually a little uncomfortable for me because I don't, I don't feel that immediacy. And, and I, I perform with my shirt off. So, <laughs> I, and so it looks hot in a theater, but when you're in a club, well, it looks hot anywhere, but you perform with your shirt off. I perform with my shirt off. Okay. Oh, well, I've just been tactile issues and I, the fucking idea that I would sweat and that people would then focus on my sweat. Right. Would fucking drive me nuts, but if there's no shirt to catch that sweat, then there's no fucking worry about it. <laughs> and so, uh, brilliant. And and I used to get real fucking in my head about what I was wearing on stage. Like I literally was like collared shirt, like a collar, no nah, black shirt, no. I need like and I and it would fuck me up. Now I just show up in whatever I want, and then I just because I'm taking it off the second I get on stage. So uh, so then <laughs> so then uh, I. I do the math and I go, well, if I shoot it at the DC Improv, uh, I go, they go, well, we're going to need to remove like 50, like 45% of the seats. And I was like, well, then hold on. Now you're fucking with the crowd. I want right. the crowd there. Right. And I was like, and they're like, well, don't you want a dolly shot? I go, I don't need a fucking dolly shot. I just want fucking cameramen to shoot it. I wanted them to just shoot it. And I said, well, I know how much I make at the DC Improv. I can make the budget for this thing at the DC. I could sell tickets that weekend, sell out fucking six shows, shoot. Two shows on Saturday. Yep. And then that, that'll be my special. And I, I was like, oh, great. And then you start the ball rolling. And then I, 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 know, I don't know if it's because not everyone gets to make money on that. But it was just like – and then it, and, I don't, and it's part of what management does. They just bring you better offers. And they're like, what would be ideal for you? And I was like, well, the two, one of these two networks. And then they're like, all right, they both have offers for you. And then I was like, okay. And then I was like, well, fuck. I just, it's like that same situation. Oh, this is what I'd want. Oh, fuck. Now I got what I want. And then in my head, I was like, I was like, I don't know. So I'm in, I'm fucking. Okay. So how do so, you, let me ask you something. You know, the devil makes a lot of deals. And when you, sometimes you sign that deal yeah. and you're like, that's exactly what I want. But you had no control of it anymore. I have this thing where, so Love is Evil was one of my best specials about my divorce and about I, I always try to pick something I would say like Love is Evil is about how fucked up my my life was with my, with my ex-wife and then I met this amazing woman who I'm married now so it was like I wanted to prove that no matter what you go through love is possible no matter how bad it gets don't get bitter like my dad did love is possible that, so I always I always like plan like the show's gotta be about something we shot the show um, Levity did it and, and they, were, they did a great job they did a great it looks beautiful but they owned it. They owned it for five years, and they sold a lot of them. And I finally actually bitched. I was like, hey, guys, you've had this for five years. I've never – we had a 50-50 deal on profits. They sent, they sent me – I had my lawyers have to track them down. It took them four months to get this paperwork. The paperwork has uh, – they made a ton of money on it, and it says at the bottom they owe me $1.80. Uh, shelving fees, uh, uh, restocking fees, blah, blah, blah. And I saw the number they sold. So I'd only given them uh, five years a license on it, and I took it back this year, and I, I'm selling it now. Every special I've kept, I have made more money uh, doing it online on my own website than anybody has ever paid me, ever. And I got to edit them. I got to shoot them. I got to pick the theater. We made money that night. You could do it. So what did you end up doing? So I, did- I'm uh- – <laughs> I mean, it's no secret. I'm at Levity, so yeah, they're uh, they're great. They're, they're Robert's I, great. Yeah, I love Judy. She's I I yeah, believe in they're, Judy. They're really great. And they did my first special, uh, my, uh, and I haven't made a decision yet. I'm, I'm now I'm stuck in this headspace where I go, where I'm like, I can tell you where I, I I'm I'm obsessed with where I get my content from. As a fan, where do I get it from? That's I want to give it to people that get it the way I get it. 
You know, you want to get down like I get down. This is how I get down. Right. I watch everything on fucking line. I watch everything on YouTube. Right. And so in my head, I was like, started thinking, what if I just did my special and just put it on YouTube? Fuck, I've never made any money off these things. I, I, I put out, a, I get a special, it's some fucking nominal fee to shoot the thing. It's not like seven a $100,000 to make to, the, to yeah. do the special. Yeah. I never not make anymore. money on the DVDs. These, my first, Norman Rockwell, they paid me a lot of money for. Yeah. Norman Rock, yeah, but you know, that, that just doesn't happen yeah, anymore. Yeah, it doesn't happen. And so I was like, what if I just shot it, put it online, and then just, and then, because that's how, I, that's, I mean, I well, you like- definitely. Here's the thing: you definitely. They would just call Netflix. You'd be on Netflix anyway. You know, there's so many. There's so many outlets now, and everybody, everybody needs content. Yeah. Now, the weird thing is for me though is I don't have like I don't have anything on Netflix. I I don't know what I've created. I've, I think I've created something with my attitude that it's a bad thing. I mean, if you talk to if you talk to Judy about me, she'd probably be like, "Oh, that fucking guy." Me and Judy no. go way back with trouble. No, no, Judy. I, as a matter of fact, I told Judy I was I was doing a podcast with you today. Yeah. And she goes, "I love Chris." Uh, he she goes uh, a little troubled. No need for a manager. <laughs> well, only because I'm 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 I think I'm better. I'm better. I know what I want instantly, and then I can pick up the phone. Yeah, you know I have, I have agent. I have a I have a manager, and he listens to me. He's actually, investing in the he he believes enough that he's investing in the movie. So, like it, that's what I think I've never had. I've never I've had managers that do this. Like yeah 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 you know. And then then if I create something, they're like, all right, we're on it now. Yeah, wait. <laughs> I just what? I I Judy is good for me because I I have I'm a big idea guy but I'm not a big follow through guy. So I say stuff like I want to write a book and she's like okay let me set that up and then she gets the ball in motion we sell the book and then I write a book. Uh I wanted I I want to do it. I've been telling her for five f- 5 years ago I said uh, my wife said something very pivotal. She said, if you have something you want, say it out loud to everybody. Don't yeah. ever. And I said it to the fucking guy when we first started this conversation to Andy, uh, uh, who was at DIY. I said, I want a man cave. Right when we bought this house, I, Leanne said, if you want that, you put that out in the universe. Let everyone know that's what you want. It's not because I always felt like you shouldn't. It was shameful to put your wants out there. Like it was shameful to say, um, I, I want to be. I want a sitcom. I was so embarrassed to say that. I mean, I'd been put through development but right when I got in the business twice, back to back. And then all of a sudden it was like, well, I'll just wait till they come to me. And then at one point my wife's like, no, if you want to do a four camera sitcom, say it out loud. Yeah. And I told Judy, I said, I want a sitcom. She said, okay. She set me up with this guy, Eric Tenenbaum. We developed probably three years in a row and uh, it never, it never ended up happening. And then I said, and then I started doing this vlog and I was like, I, well, you know what? I, I want to make my sitcom. And literally, you're one of the people that I went, you're the person that I said he had his sitcom. That wasn't like, that wasn't Fox's. Titus was yours. And you know the thing about it? I'm so proud of is that like the box sets now, to get them, they're 100 Actually, at Christmas, they were up. That were, I saw one site had them up for $320 for the box set. It didn't end up in the discount bin. Yeah, I'm proud of that. I had went through. She went. You went. You've been through development hell a couple times. I've been through. I I love development. I almost get. I have. I get depression uh, when we start making it. Really? Like, yeah, because I I love the development. I love the. I love. I love the phone call. We got a deal. We're, we got a deal at NBC. Oh, shut up. Oh yeah, yeah. It's a push put or whatever. We're gonna do it. And then sitting down and coming up with the ideas. And then I and I think it's because I've never had anything that's really gone other than just shoot a pilot. Right. But like. And it's and it's and the reason it hasn't gone is because it hasn't been good. But I feel like I get depression when I fucking get through script for the first time, and I'm like, Ooh, all the teeth are out of it. All right, so okay, so so here's what happened with Titus, and and this is this is what I learned in the forum. Um, stand for something, fucking stand for something. You know, I, I it made me change. Like Norman Rockwell was written with this idea. God, this is gonna sound so pretentious, but but because the show's funny. But I have to go from a place of where am I going with it? I had that fucked up life. My mom was mentally ill, and I said, how do I make all this? I don't want to just make fun of my mom and my dad, you know, because um, I have a different opinion of it now because of form. Like they gave me life, no matter how fucked up they were. I'm not here without them. I owe them everything, even if, no matter how fucked up they were. I owe them my my life, I, my existence. Yeah. So there's nothing they could have do to fuck that up unless they kill me, and then it's over anyway. So uh, I kind of approached it from that. But I, 
Norman Rockwell was designed to cause a paradigm shift in the way people see their screwed up lives. Because dysfunctional used to be a bad word. It was almost like a mental illness. Oh, you're dysfunctional. Oh, we feel sorry for you. Yeah. I wanted to flip that. Fuck you. I can handle way more shit than you can. I've been through so much shit. My mom shot and killed a guy. I'm in. What do you want to do? What are you going to are you going to are you going to upset me? So I, I so and then the second one was to make people not be afraid after 9/11. I, I said I want everyone to get to this place where. There's no, it's no point in being afraid. The third one was um, love is evil to make sure that people had, uh, to, to, to people know that no matter how bad their relationship was, that new love is possible. The fourth one was never illusion, because uh, never illusion was rare, because we are we're, we're this country. We're like fuck, we, we got to change this country. And then I'm gonna go watch the Real Housewives of Orange County. That's, that, so yeah. it's called never. We weren't gonna talk about it. We're never gonna do it. So I kind of wanted to call people to arms about really changing the country. That was after after the fucking crash, and then. And then voice in my head was to know that no matter how bad you fucked up in life, you're not a loser. You can still do it. Because it's all my fuck-ups in life. It's every, my worst mistakes, including losing the TV show. And then the last one um, it w- it was Anger Pursuit Happiness. I realized that I was getting happy. And I had married this great girl. And I was like, oh, shit. I had this horrible fear that my career's over. Yeah. I'm actually, life is getting good. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. And I panicked. And, um, and so I wrote this thing called Anger Pursuit Happiness. Um, which was about I got that life is going to end for fucking going to end. Don't fuck around. Don't fuck around anymore. You should never have a conversation with yourself about what should I do. You know what you want to do. Listen, Bert, you know damn well that you want to do what you want to do. When you have writers come in and br- on your special, you have this thing in your head. You see it. I know yeah. you see it. You've done it three times now. Yeah. They bring in a team of writers who – well, they go. Oh, that's a good idea, and then they go write what they want to do what in the they framework fucking of your idea. Do. Right. Right. Oh, I, we did a, a deal, and I love these guys. I'm not shitting on them, but I remember we did a deal, and it was sold on my dad. It was me and my dad, and me. It was and and being part of and travel. I travel the world, and I come home with my dad. And right. I remember the guy. I remember in the script, I was like, I I go, what the dad character doesn't like. He doesn't. <laughs> this isn't funny, really. And my dad would never do that. <laughs> and the guy goes, the guy goes, no, it's something my dad did that I thought was funny. And I go, yeah, but this we didn't sell it on based on your dad. Like, if you want to write a show about you and your dad, you should go out and you should sell that. Right. But but we we sold a show about me and my dad. So like I would, and they were like, uh, try, and they, you know, and they're, oh, hey, they're, hey, comedian, hey, comedian, hey, 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 we're writers. <laughs> We're writers, oh, so fucking makes so crazy. so. By the way, so no, your ideas are great, but we know how to make it into a script and make it palatable, okay? Dude. And you're like, fuck! I had a, I'll tell you a story. I'm in the first. This the first time this happened. Actually, it was the second. The first time this happened, I was. It was a company called C3. Rich Franks was ahead of it. I don't know what he does anymore. And I had this. It's kind of the basic idea. I pitched them the guy the idea for Titus. I pitch him. This is like four years before Titus even got picked up, uh, and. And 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 I and I said this guy this guy had just survived cancer this writer so he's edgy Titus you're edgy and I already written Norman Rockwell and so I give this guy the idea at the end of the idea Ty, you saw how Titus came out right yeah. I was uh, fucking on that every minute every oh, yeah. fucking second I didn't give I didn't give a quarter on that show nope this is gonna be, nope nope no we don't need to do black and white yes we are fuck you we're doing black and white <laughs> yeah. I don't give a shit what you, if it sucks it sucks I'll take the hit um, so this guy sits on the couch in a big meeting after the, he, he, he written the script. And this, I just read the script, and the script was ended up being me running a hot rod shop. Okay, that was one thing. Except I, w- I had a Latino buddy, because Latinos were hot at the time, who uh, got me into a lot of uh, uh, shenanigans and mishaps. There was a lot of mishaps. Um, and, uh, and I was dating these two twins. Uh, him and I both were. And we never knew which twin we were dating because they kept swa- swapping on us to be taught that thing because they thought that was funny. And that's the script that he guy fucking gave me. And I'm in the meeting, and there's like all these people. And this, and again, here's another. Titus needs to shut the fuck up at meetings. Uh, the guy goes, the guy goes, uh, script, and I, and I go, I go, I go. First of all, this script is nothing that I pitched to you. Nothing. The jokes are lame. I go, it's not. I go, it's not funny. I go, have you read this? <clears throat> and they are, they are read it. And he go, the guy go, I goes, you didn't put the ideas we ha- we talked about it that you and you didn't put it in. And the guy in, looks at me and goes, Hey, I'm the writer. I take your ideas, decide which ones I want to do, and I do those. And I went, you're fired. And Rich Franks goes, you can't do that. <laughs> and I said, and I said, <laughs> I quit. And I you walked can't out. Do that. <laughs> I, I, <clears throat> and I quit. And I, I just said, no, I'm out. I'm done. And I walked out of the meeting. So I, I've, I have a history of being that guy. So I think the best thing for me, and Judy's right, the best thing for me is to keep doing it myself. And if it fails, it fails. Uh, yeah, I, 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 no one likes. I'm taking money out of people's mouths. You know, I mean, even my even my agents are like, Live Nation was like going to put us in a, a theater tour but the money is so like they take 60 percent like they take 60 percent with really? expenses 
you know and and uh, i was like and they they were like we my agent said they can't make enough money on you in theaters and i was like okay so i i told them my, my wife used to run comedy clubs she's a comic now and i said start calling some theaters find out uh, just like i called the production company i said find find what it costs to four wall the theater and we found out and when we found out i was like you're shitting me and she said no i said okay book it let's get hire a publicist and then we start, and we sold out Minneapolis, 1,100 seats on our own with no promoter, and and we started doing it. We do that's what we do now. We're doing like 12 or 15 theater tours this year on our own with Combustion Live, my company, because at the end of the day, I don't know. I don't know if it's arrogance. If it didn't work, I guess it would be arrogance. But it's worked every time. I've sold two specials that we shot. Yeah. We're filming a movie now. This could be the one. This could be the one I could totally tank. <laughs> this might be this. I, I can. I kind of hear the engines <laughs> quitting now. I can hear that. So this could be it. This could be. It. I'm fine with that. But I'm fine with that because at the end of it, I'll be able to go. Well, here's where we fucked up. Uh, here's why it didn't work. And uh, let's do it again, except right this time. Yeah. I, 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 you, I can see your frustration. It's. It is. Uh, Have you written a script ever? Uh, yeah, I've written. I've written a few. I, you know, I. I feel like. So you. Ne- I, so, I, you so your next script, you just say, you just say, hey, I've done this three times now. I've used other writers and it hasn't been done. You guys like me. You know me. I'm writing this script. I mean, we went to a network with with writers at one point, and the network was like, like awesome, like a great meeting. And then, but then they just called and they're like, "Hey, well, can we just do something with Bert? Like, like we just want to do something with Bert." And I feel like that. I f- I feel like how the hell do you have that presented to you and not just jump on that? You know what? Like you, we don't, you and I don't, we, you and I don't know each other. I hate yeah. to be. I feel like a bro now. No, dude, they went. We want to do some birth because it's the system. I mean, this this is the system. Well, like I, the system is uh, my the for my agent to make the most amount of money. He needs to package me with his writers. So in a weird way, I mean, this is like, and I feel like, I feel like, it, and that's the problem with representation. That's the fucking problem right there. Yeah. See, right now, these okay. Here's my problem with Hollywood right now. And they don't understand – they don't understand me. They don't understand Bill. They don't understand us because or, – or they don't understand Louis. I, Bill was over here and I'm not – not. but Bill was over here t- uh, probably th- three days ago, four days ago. And I was come in the same fucking place and I was like, let's have a cigar. We just hung out and talked and he's, I think, said the exact same thing you're about to say. But keep, but keep <laughs> yeah, going. Yeah, why the fuck – first of all, they don't care about you. They care about money. And tomorrow if you broke your leg or you had a brain damage, they'd be all sad. And they would hire – they'd find – give me another Burt Kreischer dude. And they would fucking – it's – at the end of the day, agents are what agents are. Nobody loves you. No one's going to come. No one's going to – if they visit you in the hospital once, and that would be it. Yeah. You know, um, I, I own all my shit. I own all my specials. I own um, – you know, I'm going to own this movie. I'm gonna, it's like why – and at the end of the day, they, you know, I don't make a money. I mean even my agents. I book the theater tours, and, and they're like, well, are you going to pay us? And I go, I go, did you promote it, book it, or even figure it out? I said, and I said, I said no. You guys, anything you book me, you get paid on. Because you earned that, but if you you don't fucking just get to take my money, yeah. You know, I actually had I had someone I had someone call, someone some of the production company called after they offered they offered me a really shitty deal on Neverlution, and I said I didn't say no. I just said okay, that's the offer. I said okay, let me think about that. I never said another word about it. Took it on, started producing them myself, sold them online, sold. You know, you don't sell numbers, you don't sell. You know, say you're not going to sell a hundred thousand units. Yeah, but you're also not going to make. A dollar, you're going to sell ten thousand units and make eighteen dollars. It's the it's the MC Hammer perspective. <laughs> well, like he, he was what? selling them out the of his pl- trunk. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. He, had, he had, yeah, but he actually burned through money like crazy. But uh, he 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 burned through money like he had been divorced nine times. He, he by the way never put tiles in your driveway that spell out your name until the house is paid off. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, what, what was I just going to say? I was just uh, podcasting. Yeah, podcasting. When I when this first when podcasting Bill's first, a fucking master of it. My God, when this first took off, I remember agents being like, and but they not, not, they didn't understand what a podcast was yet. Right. Like I'm not saying that I understood it, but I was in it, so I got a concept of it. I got what it was doing, and I was seeing the benefits of it, and I was like, oh okay. But they I they didn't see how they could monetize it, so they started. So then all of a sudden this the fucking company shows up that now is like a it's an ad sales thing and 
oh, everyone's bringing their clients in and, and oh, this is going to be the biggest fucking thing. And in my head, I was like, yeah, but they're taking – I don't need it. I can get the ads by myself. I right. don't need anyone to get me ads. We, we actually had – we had the company that, that hosts our podcast just call us and go, hey, I got two companies that called to ask if they could put ads on your thing. And I said, we don't take ads. And they're like – and I said, I said, send me the product. And I, I, we got the product. I'm like, okay. Yeah. But I, I'm really, that's. You know who calls me about ads? Uh, Fucking Bill Burr. Like yeah. he just says, at, you know, they get, it's our company, All Things Comedy. Right. Is he, they, he just call, they just call up and they're like, hey, uh, do you want to do this? Yeah. Okay. And then when whatever they call, they're like the, you know, hey, the company needs money to stay afloat. We're all doing this and then donating our proceeds to the company, all things comedy. Would you be interested? 100%. I'll give you all the money. I don't make. Oh. I don't need to make money on this podcast. Right. I, like, I don't need to monetize. That's what I thought. It's for me to talk about the world, man. I, like uh, Mine is called, we do an Armageddon update. We I heard it. you and Bill on yours. Uh, Bill's great on that, man. Yeah. Bill's great. Yeah, well, you're, I mean, podcasting is made I think I pissed free. Bill off somewhere. I think I made Bill mad somewhere down the line. Uh, yeah, no, I did. I don't know why. I think uh, I made him mad somewhere down the line. I don't, I don't think so. He's, uh, he's, I think Bill's. Bill would actually tell you if he didn't like you. Like, <laughs> yeah. he's really... He well, we had an incident. Me and Bill had an incident. Not with each other. I am a car guy, and I'd worked on his car, and they, we get this brake kit, and I was going to switch the brakes on his truck. And the fucking... They sent us this kit, and for three days... It's something that should have taken us three hours. Yeah. Three days, I couldn't get this thing to work. And I'm good at this. Yeah. And I was like, what the fuck happened? What the fuck happened? So after three days, I called the company. I go, I go, here's the problem. I tell them, and they go, oh... When did you order that kit? I go, June. I asked Bill, and Bill goes, yeah, it's James June or something. I said, okay. June, he goes, oh. Yeah, those were marked backwards. The left is the right, and the right is the left. And I fucking, and I'm on the phone with these guys, and Bill's over there, and I uncork. I uncork. I go, do you understand this is the fucking breaks? I go, I go, I got my buddy here. I could have killed him. I go, we could have sent him out of the door like this, and it, he's dead. Dead. Yeah. And I just went off. And Bill, I get down, and Bill goes, wow. I never heard anybody talk to someone like that. <laughs> fucking bullshit no he was like that he was like fuck you just went off on some dude you know and I said he was gonna kill you he, he goes no they deserved it but wow yeah and I think Bill the good look Bill's one of the nicest guys I know greatest guy the guy on stage eh, is the guy I rarely see yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know he's just a really nice good human being who's a master at at, at putting getting everybody's frustration out he's so good at he's, just uh, pinpointing he, it. yeah he's I've known I've known him for a very long time and uh, he's one of the he is one of the sweetest guys. He his is, show great. F is for family is what is literally what have you seen it? Yet? No, it is fucking awesome. The new sitcom is a sitcom. It's a sitcom. It's it's a cartoon. Oh, okay. And it's called F is for family, and I I I don't know anything about it. I literally don't know anything about it. I know Bill did it. I think I tweeted about it because I was like, you know, is it coming friend. out? It's already out. It's on Netflix. Wow. Seguro Special comes out on Netflix, and I go to watch Seguro Special with my kid, with my one of my kids, Georgia, and F is for Family's up. And she goes, oh, what's that? Because they love cartoons. I go, oh, this is my buddy oh, no. Bill's show. I start playing it. <laughs> the first one, the dad comes in, and he sits down, and the phone starts ringing. And it's all set in the 70s. Yeah. And he's like, that fucking cock-sucking phone. Like, I'm overdoing it, but it's just cursing. And my daughter and I were laughing hysterically, and she's like, Am I allowed to watch this? And I go, yeah, it's already started. Like, yeah. and, and we watched the first episode, both of my daughters and me in the bedroom. My wife doesn't know what we're watching. And it's cursing throughout it. The dad drinks and drives. It is fucking hilarious. And my daughter was like, and it was like, so funny. This is how daddies talk. Daddies curse. And I go, because I curse. Yeah. And I was like, oh, yeah. And so then that night. I had we had friends over and I let all the kids watch it and I told their parents I go there's cursing in it. My wife had read some study that it's okay for parents to hear to curse in front of their kids. It's okay for kids to hear cursing and no it's 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 a great way to establish boundaries of what the parents can do versus the kids. Right. And uh, and so as long as you don't call someone a piece of shit or a right right as long as you're not swearing at your kids. Yeah. As if you're like if you hit your finger with a hammer and you go fuck it's okay kids right. know that they can't do it. Right. And so she heard it on NPR or something. Right. And so these kids watched it and. It was like I was like watching a kid. It was like when I, my parents let me watch uh, uh, Eddie Murphy Raw when I was like ten. When it whenever it came yeah, out, my dad didn't care. I oh. do a bit in this new show. My dad took me to see Magnum Force, a Dirty Harry movie, when I was six years old in feety pajamas at a drive-in. 
<laughs> and I'm interrupting him. In, in the first, the, the bit I do is first three minutes, a guy in a cop uniform, a guy I've been taught to trust my whole life, kicks a door in, takes out a gun, and shoots two people having naked, bushy 70s sex. <laughs> the dude falls off the thing. The girl turns full boob shot. I went through puberty at six. <laughs> then he shoots her in the boob. So now I got to buy weird magazines the rest of my life. <laughs> then she falls out a window and bleeds out into a pool. I went to that movie six years old. I came out smoking. I'm like, yeah, Dad, there's a good movie. Uh, I believe uh, Clint Eastwood's anti hero was violent. But just a reflection of society. Now I'd like to go home and burn my Dr. Seuss books because there is no God. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's like, so my dad it was the same way. He was like, well, you're fucking, what? You're going to see the world anyway. Yeah. You know, he believed that if, if you protect all these little pussy kids that, that my dad knew had friends, he'd be like, you know, your kid's going to die when he goes out in the world on his own. He's oh, going to yeah. get killed. Oh, I, I saw Eddie Murphy Raw. Him. I saw Caddyshack <laughs> in the movie theaters. Yeah. Like, I, I saw Caddyshack in the fucking movie theaters. But that, I, that was. Uh, I mean, I feel like it was a different time, but I, f- I feel like I... I... I don't. I don't. My whole new show is about this. Yeah. It wasn't a different time. Human beings, are, we are slowly evolving, sure. But this, this, all this precious kid stuff, it, it's all you're doing is raising these shiny kids. Oh, my God. If Jonathan... We t- we're teaching Jonathan Chinese. He's three, but it's an emerging market, so maybe when he's an adult, he'll know Chinese so he can be... Fucking, what are you doing? Yeah. You know, what are you doing? It's We all talk about it on stage, but it's just... It's become... It's... Be, we're supposed to undouchebag our kids. That's all. That's your only job as a parent. You know, the joke I do is, is that don't raise douchebags because you don't want to be the parent that gets interviewed after the verdict. You know, you just don't. And so, and, and all, but all these other parents are. are I tell you a quick story. I don't know how you treat your kids on grades, but um, my son got a D, and you just don't get a D in my house. Yeah. And so I said, uh, and he lied to me. I found out that he hadn't done a bunch of homework. So I said, okay, over the summer you got four ten-page book reports to write, and I made him. Write these book reports. It doesn't sound like a big deal. My dad would have, I'd have been like breaking bricks in the backyard, but he, I said, you had yeah. four, and I'd have to be perfect. So I'm at, we're at some kid's birthday party, and uh, and I said, they go, how did you do in school? I said, oh, you got all B's and A's and then one D. And and she goes, oh, that's, that's bad. I go, yeah, he had to write four book reports over the summer. And she and the mom looked at me like I was, like a Satan. Really? What's the matter? Are you coming in for this? Okay. Hi. Someone's homesick. Isla, this is Chris. Chris, how are you th- doing? Nice to meet you. Your dad says very nice things about you. Yeah. <laughs> what? Uh, Isla was homesick today, so she's been watching Teen Titans Go. Yay! So we're talking about having kids. Are you going back in the house? Okay. Are you okay? <laughs> what a All sweet. right. I love you. Well, she, uh, see now that she wants something. Now that she worked you, came in and worked you. In front of God, people, man, she fucking owns me. Yeah, right. She that kid. I, I right now the thing I'm dealing with is I have a lot of material about her, and my wife's kind of kiboshed me using it because it's all very you know like one of the jokes I was saying is I have two kids. I got an 11 year old, smart, blonde haired, blue eyes, really great kid, and I got another one too. Yeah, and and my wife's like, yeah, fucking, that's not happening. You're not saying that. Because if Isla sees a special right there, see that's this is this is my problem with parents. And I, yeah. where's your wife? Get her in here. Yeah. So I, I I I I tell people don't have a kid. Don't don't. I go and I and I do this thing called the Lamborghini life that you get to have if you don't because you can't put a car seat in a Lamborghini. Yeah. I tell this whole story about what's how your life's going to go. And kids, I've had them for ten years. I've had for, you know I've had a decade of raising kids half the time. And plus I went through a divorce. That's how people won't get divorced. Another joke I do is that. If you got divorced and you didn't have kids, you didn't get divorced. You had a long-term booty call with paperwork. That's yeah. all you had. Yeah. Was it hard to split up the CDs? <laughs> Who's going to get the Matrix box set? We better go to arbitration. You fu- I'm you going through a divorce. Yeah. Oh, did you have kids? Yeah. No. no. The, the yeah, yeah, yeah then shut about? up. It's called a breakup. Yeah, she, yeah you got freedom is what yeah. you got. You just got freedom. Good, yeah. Congratulations. Sweet bitching about it. So – and, and it, it, it's tough. People don't get – like if you're if you're listening and you don't, you don't have kids, people don't understand how hard it is. We convince ourselves, oh, my God, they're angel little Jesus tears. No, they're not. Our job is to make these little tiny retarded people who don't care. They're, they're, we download programs all day. Their, their operating system is not the same as ours. They yeah. have the shitty download speeds. And, they, <laughs> and, 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 and it's all you're doing. You're fighting against – and you have to love them because it, it's because of your kids. And uh, the joke, the laws are different now. Yeah. <laughs> the joke I do is I love my kids because I hate jail. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, my the everything everything I say on stage is is real, based in reality, one hundred percent. Right. But I think I was being too real with Isla, and Leanne saw it and was like, "The was difference like, is my kids." She, she saw Louie. 
when Louis was like doing his material on his kids and she was like, Oh, what if like, you know, what if his kids see that? And in my head, I was like, I, I can't imagine that they're not, they're going to be shocked. Like, you know, that, or, or that's that their dad. dad doesn't love them. Yeah. Yeah. And I was, and so she, she literally was like going through my acts and was like, let's just, before you do your special, let's talk about what you're going to share. Wow. Your wife is a bad network executive, dude. Yeah, I know. Do you get it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's going to hate me. I don't, that Christopher Titus better not come No, no, again. no. She's, she just, uh, she's been like, she's been totally cool with anything about her. Like she farted during oral sex and she did not want me telling that on stage. And I told it and she's like, it's funny. I don't give a fuck. Right. If it's funny, it's that's fine. But then anything about Isla's learning disability, anything about like oh. that Leanne just goes like, I'm just protecting Isla. And you, I understand it. So in my head this week, I went through and I was like, all right. Because sometimes I have a propensity to overshare. Like, Yeah, me too. Me too. I have the problem. I, I'm doing a bit of my aunt right now and she moved to Florida and, and it's not – she's wanted to be in the act for a long time and it's yeah. one of those bits that if she sees it, she probably – It, it we, might hurt her feelings. It might hurt her probably. Yeah, and like, but I'm not – nothing I'm saying it didn't happen or is untrue. Yeah. And that, that's the other fucked up part is like – is I, I'll tell you stories about my dad. Like when I, when I first met Will Smith, my dad told me um, – it was like a weird – You know people have that sentence, when I first met Will Smith? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, keep talking. And so he, goes, <laughs> my, he was like, "Let's." Will wanted to go see a movie. And my dad was like, uh, what? I go, hey, yeah, we're going to go see a movie. And he's like, oh, buddy, I think he's going to queer you. I go, what? And he goes, that's a lot of these Hollywood – Types or closeted <laughs> homosexuals. He's gonna they bring you in, lure you in with money and fame, and fuck you. And and uh, I told that story. My dad's like, I never said that. I mean, buddy, you make me out to be a homophobe. And I'm like, you fucking said that. Like my dad said, my dad thought GQ stood for goddamn queer. He actually thought. <laughs> I mean, like, you were a homophobe. My dad, too. Yeah. Uh, my dad used to say, and it, he said in an interview on the title, he's the same thing. Dads, it's weird. They will be who they are. You talk about it on stage. They go watch you talk about it. And my dad finally said, after, after I got some success, he finally said, you know, I was a single father doing my best. He goes, I didn't know that's how you saw everything. I had no oh, concept. That's fucking insane. Yeah. He, he, because he, I know of your dad through your act. Yeah, like, it took him years. At first, he used to say it, it, he did an interview with when we had the TV show, and he looks right on extra, and he goes, he goes, you know, uh, uh, I, I I never raised those kids the way he says, you, you know, and if I did, if I did abuse them, they deserved it. He says it, and he's not being funny. He, yeah. he does it, and if I be, and if I, and if I did abuse them, they deserved it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what? The fuck? Oh, I have a vivid memory. I tell on stage of the first time my dad spanked me, and I told it, and my dad. My, I told it in Philly. My whole family's from Philly, and they shared it with my dad. And my dad's like, "I never hit you." I go, "Dad, I didn't make this up. I have a vivid memory, right, right, of my sister's birthday. She goes to blow the candles out. I fucking slam her head in the cake. Did you and, really do that? Yeah, and and and, <laughs> and and it killed so hard that when my dad said he wanted to talk to me in the garage, I thought he was coming out to tell me how funny it was. Right. Like I didn't think he wanted High to do five, it in front yeah, of right. my sister. He wanted privately to be like, "Dad was fucking." So I literally walked into the garage like, this is going to be... And he was like, pull your pants down. I was like, what the fuck just happened? Wow. And I remember I remember the I remember the car was in the garage. So it was that little space between the wall and the car. Oh. And I, I, it was like, there was no a- exit. I turned around and he's like, you're getting hit. Like that, you're getting spanked for that. And I was like, I tried to talk my way out of it. I was like, what, what killed me, what, the thing that stuck with me all these years was the humiliation that I was humiliated. Right, and I was that, and I, I, I t- and once again, it's, this is what I. This is the problem with my stories is I go to emotion immediately. Right. Like I was humiliated, and I was like, "Oh, Dad, I swear to God, I won't do it again." Like, "Oh, I, I, I really, I know I messed up." And he was like, "No, this is happening," and there, it, it was like panic, and I went, "Oh, fuck!" And to this day, I think remember I was like, "No, it never fucking happened." And I was like, oh, "Okay." My dad did this daily. Like we had, like my brother to this day has nightmares. We used to go to this lake and ski. My dad, in front of everybody, would just come by my brother and yank his pants down so he was standing there buck-ass naked. Both of us. <laughs> we walked around. Like, I have mild PTSD because of my father. Dude. My dad did this shit. My dad would have slubbed my face into cake. Like, that's who my dad was. Really? And he thought it was funny as hell. He'd get drunk and be like, ah! <laughs> and, and, like, and, and, and the other parents were like, oh, my God, oh, my God. He's like, hey, it's funny. Hey, hey, get up, idiot. Stop crying. I mean, you know, that's why, you know, George, uh, George Lopez said, stop crying. My dad said all the time, stop crying. What are you crying about? And I, I learned that don't cry anymore. Just shit just happened. Oh. We would sit around on the deck of this place where my dad's buddy had this house, 
and go, when you go water skiing, and my sister and my dad, because we were raised brutally, like brutally, like we would rip on each other so hard, everybody would be like, oh my God, you guys hate each other. Like, what, are you, what are you talking about? We're laughing our ass off. What are you talking yeah. about? You guys are talking about like the worst things about each other. Yeah, it's funny. You know, and that's and that's where the comedy comes from. I don't know, man. It's a bit. I'm, I'm probably. I'm probably. That, that's also why in a net with a network, I have no problem going. Do you even fucking understand? You know, like I have no problem just saying it because in my family, you just said it. But I don't have decorum that I need for show business. <laughs> I, I feel like I. I feel like I have nothing but decorum. Like in that. In that, I just. It's like we said with the way a development goes. They want to pair you with the writer that they represent, so they can package it and get it's, the package. And yeah. it's just. How's that worked out for you? It hasn't. That's why I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this one. I'm going to do this one by myself. And it's literally because I, in you saying it to me right now going, you know what you want to do. Yeah. Like, fucking do it. Yeah. Like, yeah, I know what I want. That's what I learned in the form. This this movie we're doing called Special Unit is uh, due to the, We did a pilot in 06. And uh, it took him eight months to come in. Eight months to say no. Uh, and I got a total, horrible fucked up story about that, too. What ha- What happened. But... It's really due to the Fairness and Disabilities Act. The LAPD has to hire four handicapped undercover detectives, and I play Nick Nolte's mugshot. I play the worst cop in LA, and I got to train him. And my ex, it's Van Nuys, based in North. No, we're not, it's going to be the mayor of North Hollywood, or mayor of Van Nuys, is my ex girlfriend. She used to be a prosecutor. She put the cute whore in prosecutor, and uh, and uh, and I screwed her over. I cheated on her, so she hates me now. She's the mayor, and she's just. I, you know, I'm getting. I'm losing everything. I'm also a bad cop. I've been taking protection money from drug dealers, and I take on these four disabled people. And we're using real disabled actors because disabled actors get a lot of lip service in Hollywood, but they don't get the jobs. Yeah. They, we, oh, we love them. Those are special little heroes. Except Michael and Ronan's going to be in it, and you know, Deborah Carrington, who is in uh, Total Recall, she's she's a little person in. So I, I put all these disabled actors in it, for real, and and people are like, yeah, it's it's a good idea, and, and they, you know, they they love the idea, but no one wants to put any money behind it. So we're doing it ourselves, you know. I wanted to, the whole reason the movie it's balls out funny. I actually I, get, I sent it to Pat Oswalt's brother for punch up on it, and he just sent me back, so he's gonna help me punch it up. He's like, this is really funny, man. He goes like, Fuck. he goes way too ballsy. He goes way too ballsy, but he's a really funny. So he's really, and so, <clears throat> oh, I did it because. My buddy Mike, who and I did, there's a bit on, on, on YouTube called "The Word Retard," which my son said something disparaging, but not funny about disabled people. It was making fun of disabled people. And last night I made him watch "The Word Retard." I made him. I, I don't let my kids watch my comedy, yeah, uh, and because some of it's about their mom and stuff. And I, and and I just don't want to be in court. It's not because I'm worried that's going to damage them. I don't want to go to court again. <laughs> so uh, I watched it and at the end of it. But both my kids were laughing, and, and and they got it. They got the word retard. Doesn't it? <laughs> that's so great. <laughs> not because it's dirty. I don't want to see yeah, about their mom. Like, mom. Wait, 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 wait. Is this the same lady? That... Wait, hold on. That... <laughs> also, they might hate their mom because I am again. I'm not lying. So, I... <laughs> so, so what happened was is that that this movie I was I was just having a couple times. I was hanging out with Mike, and Mike got you can go see the word retard uh, on YouTube, and you can see the bit. But Mike, all the time, he's he's got CP. He's rolled up. Really funny. He walks. Yeah. He's really funny. And we're in Baltimore, we're in uh, D.C., and, and this woman just comes up. She looks at me and my buddy Tommy him his buddy, and his buddy Tony were there, and he and she goes, uh, what do you have, Tony? What do you have, Tommy? What do you have? And then she looks back at Mike, and she looks back at me and goes, what will he have? And I was like, what? And you see Mike, because it happens all the time. I see Mike get, you can see this thing in his eye. He's gonna, And I thought he was going to get mad. <laughs> he started acting way more like he acts like the worst retarded guy in the world. He started <laughs> acting crazy yeah. and he started going, I want your boobies. That's what I would like to order. And he starts and she's like, oh, my God. And he starts knocking shit off the table. Like if she put water down, he spilled it. Yeah. And it just went in it went up for now. And I, you know, I'm a comic. I'm like, I let him go. I was like, I was like, oh, he's I'm sorry. And then he <laughs> and he fucked her life up for a, like an hour and a half. Oh, and that's then, fucking and then great. And then he goes, "I love you, my favorite waitress. I'll be back. I'll see you next week." And it was like, and and he and I walked outside, and I, I was laughing. I, it's a true story. I tell it in a uh, voice in my head. And I walked outside, and I and I finally lost it. I was like, "Dude, that's the funniest shit I've ever seen." And he dead serious goes, "That bitch deserved it." Yeah. And so I wrote this movie, and I, the idea was um, because I want everyone to kind of get that like these people aren't. You ever be like in a store or something or a thing, and there's a guy in a wheelchair. You probably don't do it because you're because you but. And you're instinctively, I don't, I don't want to bother him. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to look at him because I'm making fun of him or I'm yeah. looking or whatever. Someone who's disabled, you, you, you kind of turn away. Well, everybody does that. So those people become these ghost people. They're just kind of going through life. The other day, uh, this happened like, two years ago. Guy in a wheelchair rolling, got gloves on, and I go, "Hey, what's going, man?" And the guy looked up at me, looked around, looked behind him, and he goes, "Hey." It's like no one says hi to him. Yeah. I was in San Diego uh, when I was working at American Comedy Company. 
walking across the street, there's this woman. She's got one leg. She's got this that with the flesh colored sock on her leg, and she's wearing like a house coat, and she's in a wheelchair. She's got the bag in front of her, and it was it was a light crossing the street, and she looked down, man. She's looked down, and um, I guess one leg will do that. <laughs> So I walk across. Dude, I've had a sprained ankle, and I've just been <laughs> fucking angry. Like, how hard is it just to take a piss in the middle of the night? Right, right. You're leaning on the way. Literally. So, so she's sitting there, and I and I walk by. I go, I go. How's it going, kid? And this woman looks up, and she didn't say hi. She said thank you. And I thought, is that how bad it is for disabled people in this country? Like, like people just they're just so marginalized. So I, I wrote this movie, and and we're gonna do it because you know it balls out funny for funny first. My rule is funny first. But at yeah. the end of it, if if people just go notice the next time they see a dude in a wheelchair, they go, "Hey, you know," and they go, "How you doing, man?" You yeah. know, just oh wow, I'm a human being. Thanks. And that's all. That's fucking awesome. Dude. Yeah, I'm I'm a little full of myself. You can hear it. No, no, no. <laughs> I can't I'm, do it unless I pick what it's about. I can't. It's funny. I can't just throw some shit out there. Yeah. It has to. I have to know what it's gonna do or what I'm trying to do. I have to have an idea what I'm trying to do. I fucking I'm I am so glad that uh that I and I don't know how this came about. I think it came about because we were all going to go try to see you in Knoxville when you were in Knoxville. Oh yeah, yeah. So. And I, we had tweeted about you and then you tweeted back like, "Oh, thanks." And then I you followed me and I DM'd you right away. I was like, "I'd love to have you on my podcast." Yeah. And you're like, "Oh, yeah, sure. Well, you know, when our schedules meet up and it's been a while, but I'm so glad I got to fucking hang out with you, man. Yeah, man. You too, man. You're, 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 it, you're, a, you're a legend, man. You're a legend. Oh, fuck and what did you say about? See, I always think when you said at the beginning that comics were talking about Norman Rockwell, I was like, I always think that like I don't, I don't hang out with comics, so I don't. Uh, I, I feel I, like I wish I could remember who it was. I really feel like I'm on the out. I'm, I'm, I'm like the rings of Saturn. I circle the world, but I'm not really part of it. I can't. I'm, I wish I could remember who it was. I, but they, they were, they were saying that you had done this. You had done this as a one man show, and then you, yeah. but you, then you did it a little bit on the road, but then you brought it to Montreal. Maybe, yeah, it we was... did it. We did it. We did it here at the Hudson Theater, and, and the night it got the night that the network came to see it, we had eighteen people in the audience, and it yeah. was really angry. It's about it's before you got to remember at that time Seinfeld was doing like if Seinfeld was huge, and it was like hey, ever know the socks, and I went up and go, my mom shot and killed a guy. Yeah. You know, I had this girlfriend that used to punch me in the face repeatedly. I, you know, my dad, I did a bit called anti-dad about how negative my father was. And it was no, no bullshit. It was like, you know, I, I, I talked about losing my mind after my mom killed herself and being on an airplane. And, and I, I didn't have any emotion about it. And then I was on this fucking airplane and I'm reading a Newsweek. And the Newsweek says, uh, mental illness, genetic. It was this article about how yeah. mental illness, will, if you're between, if you have it in your, if you have it in your family, there's a really high probability that it's going to happen to you. And I'm reading this article and this thing, and my mom had killed herself, and I'm flying back, and I'm like, and I fucking, I, 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 they serve turkey, and my mom was a great cook, and I smelled it, and dude, I don't know what happened, but I started sobbing on this airplane, and I had to get up, and I had to run to the bathroom, and like people were like, what the fuck is going on? And I stayed in the bathroom like an hour, just just racked of like, because I, I hadn't talked to my mom in 14 years, and I just all came out in this airplane bathroom, and the stewardess was like, what the fuck is going on? And I go, why are you, sir? What are you doing? And I'm like, I'm fine. I'm okay. And, uh, and so that was in the show, and and uh, and we did it. And I, I I just thought it's the only time in my life. It was the first time in my life actually I felt that I was doing the right thing, and that's what I want you to get. Like you, you're really an easygoing guy. I'm not. I'm not. I'm it's to a fault. I'm, yeah, an I'm not easygoing, guy. but there's a point, and I call it growing a tumor on your soul. You have done this three times now. You deserve a show. You know what you want the show to be. Yeah. Um, and I, this is what I was doing before when I told, when I, when I, we went into pitch Titus to Fox, I said, guys, I'm going to write on the show and, and, and I go, I want to do this show, nothing else, no modifications. This is the show I want to do. And I said, if you guys don't want to do it, that's great. I understand. Thank you for this meeting. Great meeting. And I said, but if you want to do it, I will give you, I will bleed for it, but I'm only going to do this. I've done this three times now yeah. and we either going to fail my way or, or succeed my way because I've already failed your way three times. I fucking, I feel like that's, I, I, should, I should get that tattooed on my. But I'll, it's, you know, you can't, here's the thing is you can't, it can't be a trick. You can't be doing it. You have to mean it. Like I meant yeah. it. I walked out of that meeting and my, my agent at the time goes, Bruce Smith, who's a great guy. He goes, he goes, well, I've never had someone in a meeting go, uh, we're doing this or not. Thanks for the meeting. If you don't want to do it, great. <laughs> I never told him. I've never heard someone tell him that they don't really care whether they, I, I basically said, I don't care if you buy it or not. That's what yeah. I want to do. It's, and, it's such, it's the, it's the way that good shit gets made. 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, Louis. I mean, Louis said, Louis said, what? Give me, give me what this much money a week, and no one talked to me. Less money and no notes. Yeah. And then I apparently, from what the story goes, he gave us first thing. He's like, I, I could use some notes. Like now, he's like, help. <laughs> he was like, just a few notes. Like, am I going in the right direction? Because I might be like, <laughs> yeah. Well, Langreff is such a great, great guy. The guy that that, that okayed that, and, and and I think Bill had a shot. I'd like to see the cartoon, man, because Bill's Bill's it's fucking. So good, right? It's so good. I, you know, I don't want. I, I think with Titus, we I hated sitcoms. I hated sitcoms so much, and they were so lame. And we did Titus, and the first thing was called Dad is Dead. We did an we did an episode where we tried to, we had an intervention to get my dad to drink again, because for a while my dad met this chick and he stopped drinking for a while, and he became like this laser focused asshole. He didn't get nice. He was just really aware of everything. Oh fuck! And we were like, oh fuck, it's so hard to live with you now. Why? Because because. <laughs> Because you're aware and like you know what we're doing. It before when you were drunk, there was a haze that you get, you had to get through to see what we were doing. Yeah. Now, and so uh, we wrote an episode where we had an intervention and we treated it just like an intervention to get him drinking again <laughs> and prove to him that he was better when he was drinking hard. My family, I quit drinking for six months when I first met Leanne, and uh, and just like losing weight, feeling good, and and I remember I went home for Christmas. And I was going to, Leanne and I were going to go to Italy. We were just dating, and uh, I wasn't drinking. And my sisters were like, "Hey, like you're going to drink again, right?" And I was like, <laughs> "And I was like, I don't know. Like it's a problem." Yeah. And my dad was like, "Buddy, let's not. I mean, it's okay. okay to have a glass of wine." And I was like, "I don't know." I, I go, and I was like being honest with everyone. I was like, "I've been drinking pretty hard since I was 24, 22. Since I was twenty two, I've been drinking pretty hard. I'm." 28 right now i think i could use a break and they're like hold on i remember my dad sitting on the thing pouring me a (laughs) glass of wine and going buddy have one and i didn't i was and i that whole time i was there i didn't and then i went to this is sound even sound crazier but i went to italy with leanne and we're out to dinner and she was like she was like you can have a glass of wine and i was like Okay, and and I had a glass of wine, and we had the best fucking night ever. It was snowing in Venice, and we got lost in the streets, and we were buzzed. I didn't realize my not drinking had become a problem. Yeah, and then (laughs) then I started drinking again, and I haven't stopped. (laughs) I haven't stopped. (laughs) When you're not drinking becomes a problem, you're affecting your whole family. Oh, We did. That was the whole thing. That's fucking great, man. And and we would pitch. It came to a point where we would pitch stuff to the network, and and go as far as you want. Don't ever. I would tell you this. We had the last piece of advice. And then again, I only had one show, and I ended up getting canceled. I We did. 54 episodes I'm proud of all of them but three uh, which is which is a pretty high percentage very um, we did an episode on uh, called Tommy's Not Gay about gay bashing where where uh, Tommy we always thought care he was gay but it turned out his dad was a closeted gay man he was just raised by this closet and he just picked up his dad's shit because the whole premise of the show was based on everything from your childhood so it, during that episode um, Tommy's dad goes down to find him and gets the shit beat out of him by these two rednecks because he's a gay guy and um, so we wrote this episode, and there's a there's a black and white space, and, and Chris Sheridan, who's a brilliant writer, hated me for this. He he kept we had a, we had a screaming argument in the writer room. I did this thing about Matthew Shepard. I look in the camera, I go Matthew Shepard. Um, uh, when they found him, they found he was gay. They they hung him on a fence, beat him, and hung him and let him to die because he was gay. And my character just goes because he was gay. They killed him. Wait, they killed him because he was gay. And the, my my character just in the black and white gets yeah. it, just gets it. And Chris Sheridan's just going, he's going, no, 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 he's, dude, you, we're a comedy, you can't go that far, you can't go that far. And I'm like, I, I'm like, wh- why? And Zach Ward, the guy who played my brother, goes, at the end of that episode, he goes, you know what? He goes, Will and Grace doing that is preaching to the choir. He goes, we have NASCAR dads and NASCAR families. He goes, doing that for them? He goes, that's fucking stand-up or something. So there's something you want to say, man. And and look, my, my old thing, I'm kind of like the satanic Tony Robbins when it comes to your own creativity. What makes them think? And and and, and about what? And this they hate this. If you're an executive, congratulations on your job. You have put the time in ten thousand shows. That means you've earned every fucking laugh you've gotten, and everyone you get now. This Ivy League guy comes in and tells you what he thinks is funny. Really? Let me see one of your scripts. Can I see one of your specials? Can I see how often you've made a group of people laugh? And they'll say, they'll look at you like, well, you know, I just have an opinion. Right. And it's fucking, why don't you just, let, let me make you money. Let me make you money. Now, in the past, I've just gone, hey, stop talking. Like, if yeah. the, it's not funny. I've actually told guys in current in meetings, it's not funny that we can't make that funny. I'm better now at diplomacy. 
<laughs> but man, do I, I, I just, I, I, why waste all that time when you can just get it done? I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I think I'm an asshole. I think we can just nail it down that I'm just an I'm asshole. Not an asshole. <laughs> you know what I mean? Not. I get it though. But I'm a very strong-willed. Nope. This is what we're doing, and uh, and and I think that pisses them off. <laughs> I'm sure. Actually, I show got canceled. I'm sure that pisses them off. I think you. I think you were the first predecessor of what people are starting to go to now when they're like, no, it's. Like I mean, everyone had a deal in the fucking nineties or in the early two thousands, yeah. and and just did whatever they wanted you to. Ah, you're a beer salesman this time. You're going right. to do this, and you, you look at and I think Louis did, was doing exactly what you he wanted to do what you were doing on Titus because he had the same do you project. Know Forbes, Forbes wrote an article for that online that says that Titus was do, Titus was doing Louis fifteen years before Louis did it. Dude, he did the same project. Lucky Louis, Louis Saint Louis. Uh, he had that show every time he'd fucking try to write the show about a dad who was, you know, a little bit fucked up and and it never worked until the finally the he was like, you know what? It's not about the money. I don't care about the fucking right, money. Right. Let me make my thing. And and imagine what that does, what that does for your freedom and your soul. And then if you fail, you, you can't say I have a suck. I failed. You're like, I did it my way. I fucking did it. We did. Uh, we did. uh this season of birth conqueror and it was just it was just at a point where uh the network was like you uh, the guy the head of the network at the time said oh you can do whatever you want we just want to do the show again he's like i just whatever you want and i talked to dan adler and i talked to him on the phone i said i'll do the show but i really want to just do whatever the fuck i want i don't want to i don't want to do reads i don't want to do intros i don't want to do like forced fucking interviews i just want to go out and fucking have fun and he was like that's it that's all we'll do and they then you know everyone gets scared, so they send a director out who is like, "Well, oh, I'll show him." And he said at the first meeting, he said to one of my cameraman, he was like, "He was like, hey, Bert doesn't need to know everything." Uh, and uh, uh, my cameraman was like, "Who's been on? Who I've worked with for six years." Was like, uh, "You're talking to the wrong guy." Yeah, right. And, exactly. <laughs> and uh, I didn't do one. Read. By the way, there's a mic on my wrist that yeah. actually Bert has had earpiece. Yeah. What you just said, that's how much that Bert knows. And uh, and I didn't. And he ended up getting fired uh, for other reasons uh, than than that, but. Um, and I just, it, I was literally left to my own devices and I made 13 episodes of a show that has no, like, like I'm part of me is like, if it does well, then fucking thank God. But if it does poorly, everyone will be like, well, okay, we let Bert You're go. also not an idiot. You, did you sit down and editing and watch it? I watched, yeah, I watched every... And you helped, do you help put it together? I'm executive producer. Well, fuck them, man. Look, that's what people don't it's get. F- it's funny as fuck. There you go. And it is, it is... It doesn't look like a regular TV show. It's like the fucking intro read for Jersey. You know, they give you like, they'll give you in unscripted, uh, hosted reality or whatever I do. They they give you a script. They still give you a script. It's called unscripted hosted reality. They give you a script. I'm in New Jersey. The great thing about New Jersey is it's got a lot of trees or whatever. Yeah. And then you're scenic driving through trees. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm not fucking doing any of that shit. And they're like, well, this is what they, yeah, I'm not doing it. And so my intro read for Jersey is, um. (laughs) <laughs> Jersey's like a fat ass. Like, not everyone's into it, but if you're into a fat ass, you're into a fat ass. And then, I'm, and then I stop and I go, oh, I'm sure there's an editor who doesn't like that read. He's like, can we have a little TV more friendly? I go, big tits. And so, like, that's my intro to Jersey. And I and they ended up, because I did nothing else, I wouldn't do anything else, they have to use it. Right. And it's fucking it's so funny. The whole the episode is probably the best episode of television I've right. ever made, and it's a travel show, which which means you the, talking about breath of fresh air. Good man, good for you, good yeah. for you. And it, it, it's we have been treated like monkeys for so long. There's something about comics that, and I, I'm gonna say that very few people really get. It's like it's almost like we're the retarded kids they put off to the side, and sure. they like you get into a room and they're like, oh yeah, you yeah, know you're really funny. We're not gonna let you do what you do. We're gonna oh, have these guys do it. They want it. They they want they want you to be able they go yeah we got a funny guy but i hope he does the thing i saw before like i like uh just, just be like what the f-? like like make a noise yeah. that's all they want i remember, remember when, titus's hair thing remember when christ used to open his eyes really yeah. wide god i hope he brings can, that can you just grab the pizza and then open your eyes wide and look at camera just real quick <laughs> within five seconds and, and i remember being like i can't i, I can't do any of that shit I, I can do stupid stuff where like i make a bad joke 
And then when the person starts talking, go, hang on, wait for it. They're still laughing at home. I want that to finish before we say something. Right. And then everyone goes, what the fuck is this? And you go, I don't know. That's my sense of humor. That's what right. I think is fucking funny. Right. And then once you do that, it's like once you do the thing, then they want you to just do that over and over again. They're like, can you? Like I said one time, I said, gangster. This is like six years ago. I said something, gangster. And every fucking script we got was like, can you call this ride gangster? And I was like, I did it one time. It was a joke. Uh, it was mockingly. If I start doing it as a bit. I don't know. Well, no, you're absolutely right, man. Look, man, at the end of the day, and this is the last thing I'm going to say because I re- this is the podcast with comics. Uh, we it doesn't it crosses a pretentious light at one point. No, you don't. You no, feel like it does. No, I. By the <laughs> I way, feel, I always feel is, like I feel like I'm like we've just talked about how here's how cool we are and stuff, but we're, but we're not. No, just, we haven't. But that's the. This is by the way the best podcast I've done since Stanhope. Like. Stan Hope and I went out, and that's the other problem is that I'm like that guy's a genius. Talk about a guy who doesn't give a fuck, that, and he and happy lives a happy life. Really doesn't give a fuck. Nope. Re- no. and, and, I still give a fuck. I because I, I, I'm doing it myself, yeah. but I want it to do well. I want to figure it out. I want to do it my way and have it do well. Stan Hope doesn't care. Doesn't give <laughs> yeah. a fuck, and and that's like holding him up to like a deity. It's like as a comic, you're like Stan Hope. Yes, yes. he's uh he he's. Fucking! I don't want to hang out with him. I'm scared to death of hanging I, out with him. I'm supposed to. I'm. I, I, I made a promise to myself because every time he has a Super Bowl party, I've always wanted to go. So this year, I'm like, fuck it, I'm canceling my Sunday show. I'm gonna fly out and I'm gonna go to Stanhope's in Bisbee for the Super Bowl. And and as I'm like doing the, my wife's like, hold on, you're not spending it with your family. And I was like, I kind of always wanted to go to Doug's, right. and she's like. Hang on, your kids want to want to see you. You leave out again. You're going to go fly to a guy's house to spend it. And I'm like, and then and and then it looks like I'm not coming home until like later Monday, and and then I leave again Wednesday. And my wife's like, let's talk this out. And I was like, all right, all right. So, but I but I love hanging out with that guy. He had dinner with my family. He came out. My, we did a podcast. Right. Just drinking, fucking smoking cigarettes, smoking cigars. And then my wife comes out. She's like, it's getting dark. We're gonna have dinner with the girls. Doug, would you like to stay? And he's like, I'd love to. Teaches my daughters how to do a spit take, eating dinner with my kids, literally holding on to the the fucking Santa Claus myth in his the palm of his hands, going, I could ruin it for them right now. And part of me is like, is he going to do that? It was fucking. And then we did another podcast. We can't stayed out and did another one. <laughs> he was he's he's a fucking. My, he's like you that he four walls his own theaters and just goes, I'll, I'll do it myself. I don't. Yeah, need my wife used to used to book him when she ran some of the funny bones, and she and and he's just. She, it's a, he has what Hicks has, or like Doug can actually like, motherfuck an audience so bad and then flip it on a dime and get him right back. It's amazing to watch. He's someone like you who it seems very stream conscious off the top of his head, but is very meticulous about what he says. He's like, no, I fucking write all this shit. It has to be because yeah. if because there's some things I've listened to where and it's like like there was a, that football bit he did about the raping the football player that was on the last album. I was like. I was listening to the and I said that's like Carlin writing Modern Man. Like you, the words were it was so dense. Yeah. I was like, wow. Yeah. I, I you know I love great comics. I love great comics, and and I don't think I don't think great comics are just a certain genre. Like Maria Bamford, it, it blows me away. And then Doug, I can listen to Doug and it blows me away. And then I listen to I can listen to Jerry Seinfeld still and go, wow, that's just that's masterful. Um, so I, I, you know, this, these people like get this attitude about comedy, like it's all like, oh, those guys, cause those, that kind of comedy sucks. Fuck you. Yeah, <laughs> I like all comedy. Maria yeah. Bamford, uh, Maria Bamford has blown me away. Literally twice where I went, like, I was like, what the fuck? When she did that, uh, yeah. that I need to quit series, this. Yeah, and oh, then yeah. and, and that and I, I didn't know if it was real or not or if scripted, and it was all done from her bed, and I was like, oh, shut the fuck up. Then she released a comedy album from her couch. She just t- <laughs> did her hour on her, her parents. Couch. Yeah, and I was like, shut the fuck. Both times I was like. I was like, here I am thinking I'm doing something original. I'm not doing shit. Like, right, exactly. I gotta fucking relook at the fucking paradigm. Yeah, well, the problem is with it is that it's hard to. I mean, I, I it, you know, there's, there's, there's only. I mean, Andy Kaufman. There's not a bunch of those. No, you know, there's not, not a bunch, not of, a bunch of, of genuine ones. No, there's people that have tried to do. They try. Hey, that works. Yeah. Yeah. No, if it, he didn't, you know, he didn't care either. I don't know. Dude, we're, we're getting way off yeah. on track here, dude. So. So, uh, so yeah, Norman Rockwell, uh, back to what we started. Norman Rockwell was the first time I became funny, and it's the first time I got done with that show, and I felt freedom. Like, I fucking, like, you, what you're talking about, you're a little, that's a travel show. It's a yeah. travel show. Let's yeah. just be honest. Travel show. You're good at it. You're really good at it. But there's something you want to do and something you want to say. 
fucking say it, man. Because you know why? We all have cameras. Everybody has a camera on their fucking helmet now driving yeah. around. You know, we're, uh, there's some stuff I'll tell you. Well, I'll tell you later. We'll do another. When, when it happens, I'll tell you. We'll do another podcast if you don't mind. I, I would love that. But I want to hear it. So I'm going to have you on our podcast after you get this next deal. And then you're going to tell us how it went. I'm, I'm done. All right. Thanks, brother. Awesome. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. This episode was brought to you by The Machine.